the uh, SCB TMR. My name is Scott Reeder. I'm the program chair and president-elect of the society. And I'm very excited about this uh, special session that we have this afternoon on fostering a culture of innovation. Just a couple of, uh, of comments on that. When About a year ago, when we started to plan the curriculum for the a week this, uh, for this meeting, we wanted to try to capture the essence of the society and what we mean and what, what the society is about in one word. And the one word that kept coming up was innovation. And of course, when we put innovation with our location here in Denver, Mile High City, we came up with the tagline of Mile High Innovation to Practice. And so we're really thrilled this afternoon to have an exciting, uh, exciting new um, uh, avenue for uh, presenting innovation in the society. We've uh, come up with a new venue called the Presidential Lecture, which is the first time we've done this in the society history, and we have a really exciting program for you today. And with that, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Susan Asher, who's our president, to invite our keynote speaker to the podium. Thanks, Scott. It's an honor to introduce Dr. John Bennett for our inaugural Presidential Lecture, and so on message given this meeting's tagline of Mile High Innovation. Dr. Bennett is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation Initiatives at the University of Colorado Denver Anschutz Medical Campus, where he directs InWorks, a new initiative that helps faculty, students, researchers, and clinicians create and innovate across widely diverse disciplines. Dr. Bennett received his undergraduate degree from Rice University, where he was later on faculty, and he received his master's and doctorate degrees in computer science from the University of Washington, Seattle. Prior to InWorks, Dr. Bennett directed the Atlas Institute, a Colorado university-wide initiative that explores ways in which information communication technology can benefit human society. He also held the position of Associate Dean of Engineering at CU, where he developed and shepherded educational initiatives. As one might expect, Dr. Bennett's research interests focus on technology development, distributed computing, I looked that up in Wikipedia, I now know what that is, it's very high level, but everybody can do it, and STEM education. He has trained a legion of graduate students, and his commitment to education was recognized by the W.M. Keck Foundation who presented him with their national award for engineering teaching excellence. Oh yeah, and along the way, he founded and led two successful startups. Inventor, innovator, educator, mentor. Please join me in welcoming Dr. John Bennett. First, we're gonna see if our technology is working. Well, thank you, Susan, for that kind introduction. Uh, for over two decades across four university campuses, I have built programs that intended to facilitate in a collaborative innovation. I thought I would take a few minutes this afternoon to tell you what I learned and how you might apply some of these principles yourself. My remarks are in an academic context, but I hope you'll find that they apply in other contexts as well. But first, a few caveats. I don't speak for the University of Colorado, or at least when I do, I'm a little more careful about what I say. Sadly, no one has offered me a trip to Maui to influence my remarks this afternoon. Um, and like a lot of us, I suspect, my descriptions of progress that we have made at the University of Colorado reflect the creativity, hard work, perseverance, and intellect of my colleagues, collaborators, and students. I just try to stay out of their way. Finally, I, I know a fair amount of physics, but I know very little about the application of that physics to imaging human tissue, so I thank you for welcoming a computer scientist to your midst. And I know you're all busy people, so if you need, um, if you need to check your email, let me give you a one-slide version of my talk. First, interdisciplinary collaboration is hard. Innovation is both hard and poorly understood, the world is changed by people who show up with vision, optimism, and determination. Trying to change academic culture is like trying to roll a dead whale down the beach. <clears throat> when seeking to create change, first try to engage and collaborate. If that fails, try again. 
If that fails, circumvent. It's often better to ask forgiveness than permission. And when building new programs, try not, try not to lead a trail of blood and feathers. So let's start with innovation, which is fundamentally a social endeavor. Everyone talks about it. Everyone thinks everyone else is doing it. Everyone thinks they should be doing it. Many claim they're doing it. There's a lot of confusion around the subject, and first attempts are often disappointing. Yes, there are other social endeavors that meet these criteria. So what do I mean by innovation? To me, innovation is the process of translating what we can imagine into something that we can experience. In addition, the results of this process should matter. It should fulfill an unmet need, solve a problem, improve the quality of someone's life, or have some other positive impact on human society. Sometimes we in the academy lose sight of this. As a result, we're increasingly called upon to demonstrate value to communities that we serve, our students, our geographic locale, our state, our nation, the world. Our responses often point quite reasonably to the quality and volume of the basic research conducted by our colleagues, expecting our audience to see a clear link between basic research and community benefit. However, that path from research to result to demonstrated benefit can be long and the links tenuous, particularly for a non-specialist. We also have old ideas about education. Most universities focus on translating knowledge that is relevant, transferring knowledge that is relevant today with little thought given to the preparation of students for tomorrow. We also continue to apply old values to this process, how to monetize the transfer of knowledge, how to credential the results, how to improve our rankings without trying to improve what we actually do. So what's the alternative? The challenge we face is how to constructively incorporate new ways of thinking into teaching, scholarship, and practice. Interdisciplinary innovation has led to significant advances in a host of disciplines, and in some cases has resulted in the creation of entire new disciplines. In spite of these advances, many university faculty and administrators remain uncomfortable with interdisciplinary research and teaching. So how can we better support interdisciplinary work? Well, first, faculty and students need to be able to readily interact across disciplinary boundaries. Second, faculty need to be able to engage in interdisciplinary research without endangering their careers. Third, since interdisciplinary interaction is not our natural way of doing things, we need to create catalysts on campus that facilitate such an interaction. Finally, we need administrative commitment to make this happen. It is incredibly hard to do this incrementally. So where do we start? Well, at Colorado, we were inspired by the Lockheed Skunk Works, a term that dates back to World War II. In 1943, an a Lockheed engineer named Kelly Johnson was asked to develop an aircraft that nobody knew how to build. He set to work and transformed both engineering design and organizational design by creating a carefully crafted organization with small interdisciplinary teams, a flat managerial hierarchy, significant autonomy, autonomy among those groups, low in administrative overhead, and a profound commitment to excellence across the organization. As some of you probably know, the Lockheed Skunk Works was a stunning success. Probably the most revolutionary aircraft designs in history came out of that shop. By the way, it was called the Skunk Works because he set up shop near an old plastics factory and the smell was awful. The term Skunk Works has become part of the entrepreneurial lexicon. So what would an academic Skunk Works look like? How can we incorporate these ideas into our research, teaching, and practice? At Colorado, our approach was to create InWorks, an integrated set of programs that facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration, facilitate the transition from idea to prototype, promote innovation and entrepreneurship, and encourage risk-taking and leadership. InWorks is a two-campus initiative that brings together faculty, staff, students, together with entrepreneurs, K-12 teachers and educators, people from government, all to work on hard problems that matter to humans. We do two primary things. We teach people how to do that, 
how to collaboratively work together, how to find common vocabulary, how to work across disciplinary boundaries. And we provide extensive facilities to realize what their intellect can imagine. Our mission is to impart the skills and habits of mind that allow people to collaboratively create impactful solutions to human problems. We seek to create both innovative solutions and lifelong innovators. What do I mean by a lifelong innovator? The personal traits of innovators have been discussed and written about for decades, but I think it's fair to say that the char those characteristics have a consensus around a few core ideas. First, empathy, a deep understanding of the humans that we seek to serve. Intense curiosity about themselves, about the world. The ability to see both the forest and the trees. Optimism, an inherent belief that there is a way to do something better and that we can find it. The ability to collaborate and a bias toward action and experimentation. Importantly, these characteristics are not innate, but rather they represent a set of skills and habits of mind that can be nurtured, taught, and mentored. InWorks was created to serve that need and built around four key ideas, design thinking, computational thinking, radical interdisciplinarity, and disruptive innovation. Let me briefly touch on each of these, starting with design thinking. <clears throat> At its core, design thinking is a human-centered process that facilitates collaborative, creative collaboration. It provides a vocabulary for being intentional about the way we work together on these hard problems. And it has a laser focus on outcomes over process. If you want process improvement, go learn about Lean. Members of the academy, particularly those of us who are faculty, find the design thinking process unsettling. This is not a new problem. Francis Cornford, a Cambridge scholar of some note at the turn of the last century, famously wrote a monograph called Microcosmographia Academia, which was a tongue-in-cheek guide for young faculty. Francis Cornford went by, I, by FM because his spouse was also named Francis, his spouse who was the granddaughter of Charles Darwin, uh, and he didn't want to be Francis and Francis Cornford. In that monograph, Cornford coined the principle of the dangerous precedent, in which he states that every public action which is not customary either is wrong or if it is right is a dangerous precedent. It follows, therefore, that nothing at a university should ever be done for the first time. <laughs> Computational thinking is our second pillar. Why? Because there's an incredible amount of really in interesting scholarship at the boundary between computing and insert any other discipline here. When I was looking through the program of this conference, I would guess that half of the presentations you know, involved work between tomographers and computer scientists. Second, information and communication technology has profoundly impacted our society. We do not fully understand that impact, which touches nearly every area of endeavor, and we understand even less what is yet to come. We are also overrun with data. It's estimated that the internet produces data at the rate of almost 29 terabytes per second. That's a lot, by the way. Most of those data are generated by geolocated individuals who self-report items of personal interest. Those data could use productively to improve education, healthcare, government, or they could be used to destroy the foundations of civil society. The questions about who owns our data and whether we have a digital right to be forgotten are part of the great social debate of our time. They are also examples of the kind of radical interdisciplinarity that we need to that we need to address hard problems. Solutions to hard problems almost always require more than one kind of knowledge. And the knowledge needed to solve those problems is often to be found in a completely different domain than the problem itself. Interdisciplinary innovation is thus an essential tool for solving challenging problems, and it's a, an essential skill set for those entering the future workforce. The academy isn't very good at interdisciplinary. 
The way we structure knowledge in, in silos perpetuates disciplinary boundaries that impose real challenges to how we go about our work. So how might we do it better? Well, we can't just throw a bunch of people in a room from different disciplines and hope for the best. We're creatures of habit, and absent inter intervention, we'll fall back on old habits and just sit at the same table with our friends and colleagues. We need a shared vocabulary of collaboration that honors different expertise. We need to understand and be intentional about team dynamics. We need to avoid needless hierarchy. We must recognize that innovative leadership is not about creating goals and incentives, rather it is a process of giving direction that promotes creative problem solving. Everyone in the room has probably heard of Clayton Christensen and has probably heard the term disruptive innovation. Dr. Christensen has made a cottage industry of, dis of disruption and whatever you may think of him, he has a point. For example, think about anything having to do with computing, the number of transistors on a microprocessor, the cost of a megabyte of memory, the number of users on Facebook, the number of Google searches per second. Whatever metric you choose, I would posit that it has changed, it has grown exponentially, and in some cases has been doing so for several decades. Human social systems have never in history had to cope with that rate of change. Our customs, our laws, our schools, our business, government, our citizens are ill-equipped to cope with change at that pace. As educators, how can we help respond? Well, to start with, we need to do some things differently. When I ask employers about what they want in their new hires, the first thing they say after you know, solid academic preparation in their discipline is, Created, they want creative idea people who are capable of adopting new ways of thinking, of synthesizing available information into actionable alternatives, of developing practical solutions to complex problems even when the problems themselves are not well defined, communicating effectively across disciplinary boundaries, collaborating effectively in interdisciplinary teams, and leading when leadership is called for. I call such people lifelong innovators. The education of such individuals should represent a key objective of the academy, one that can both distinguish a university campus and help chart, chart its course. At Colorado, we have built a two-campus program that embodies these ideas. First, on the downtown campus, where we have a primary edu primarily educational enterprise, we offer courses and an undergraduate minor Graduate, my, graduate certificate, an undergraduate certificate, and human-centered design and innovation. Those, that minor and those certificates are open to every single major on campus. We also offer workshops that range from two hours to two days that develop specific skills. And finally, we engage actively with members of industry, government, K-12, teachers and educators, and individual community members who just have interest. Our approach is a little different on the medical campus. There we focus on idea to prototype. We have a very active technology transfer organization. I suspect that most camp medical campuses do. But you can't patent an idea. You need to reduce it to practice. So we help with that. We also support directly clinical and research efforts where you know, someone might need a proof of concept prototype to help with their R01 or a surgical team might want a better model so they can plan a difficult surgery. And finally, we, have, we offer a collaborative interdisciplinary environment that serves a growing community of innovators. Between the two campuses, we have extensive prototyping facilities. We're not a manufacturing facility, but I'd like to say that we can manufacture one of almost anything. Let me give you a few examples of the kinds of things we do. So surgical assist devices, therapeutic assist devices, drug delivery devices. Unbeknownst to me, a student developed a satellite launch vibration damping system that was launched into space by his employer. We have an active program in 3D modeling that takes imaging data produced by your colleagues and are, that are then used 
for medical education, communicating to patients about both their disease and its treatment, and for pre-surgical planning. We also use commercial virtual reality hardware to provide surgical, uh, pre-surgical planning uh, for multiple perspectives. We've developed microfluidic devices that are used in pulmonary research, and we've in been involved in interactive immersive art. You're wondering why there's a picture of a red striped zebra on this slide. It's because the NWORKS is the world's leading facility for repair of animatronic talking zebras. This is Candy the zebra, who lives at the Houston Zoo. The story of how we came to repair Candy, who had lost her voice and ability to move her head, uh, is long in the telling, but nonetheless, Candy showed up on our doorstep. We repaired Candy and she is now back at the Houston Zoo where you can see her this holiday season. So if I may, let me acknowledge some of my colleagues who actually do the work I've been talking about. Their names are here. I also want to acknowledge all of our collaborators from the faculty, staff, industry, education, government, and community, and most importantly, a host of hardworking students who make what we do possible. Through everything we do, we take a singular approach which is to collaborate with everyone and compete with no one. I actually mean that. In terms of execution, we believe that what we do should matter, that we should know and adhere to laws and policies that are relevant, guidelines, not so much. That we've never done it that way before is not a policy. That outcomes matter more than process, that humans matter more than technology, we believe that we shouldn't be afraid to try something that might not work, and we definitely shouldn't be afraid, afraid to stop doing something that isn't working. We also believe in failure, as strange as that might sound. We try ideas we know might fail because it's an essential element of innovation. We evaluate everything we do, we learn from our mistakes, and we try again. In the entrepreneurial lexicon, lexicon that's failing fast. In the words of the great Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. We are also asked why we're not a fee-for-service cost center. And the answer is it would be antithetical to our mission. Innovative ideas don't always come with funding. And everyone has the potential to be an innovator. Fee-for-service engineering, fee engineering facilities already exist on campuses if you know exactly what you want. But if you have an idea, InWorks is prepared to help anyone from undergraduate intern to medical student to chancellor realize what their intellect can imagine. So what do you need to try these ideas at home? Well, if you want something like InWorks, you need the authority to hire a small group of really smart, dedicated, and hardworking people. If you do this, I'd encourage you to go to privilege excellence over program fit. Look for best athletes. Second, you need some space. Turn down the old cadaver lab. You need some seed funding. You need a high degree of autonomy and the authority to create new programs. I think of this as the best of both worlds, the powers of a dean without having to go to dean's meetings. You can start small. Small isn't the same thing as incremental. Even if you're not a dean or director, you can apply to these ideas in your own work. You do that by focusing on human values and building empathy. Bias toward action, embrace experimentation. Try to get some, you know, learn from failure, try something else. Write down what you're thinking, do some planning, work from that coherent vision. Find people who disagree with you and listen to what they have to say. Privilege outcomes over process. Separate policy from mechanism. What you're trying to do from the way you're going to do it. Work for strategic change. Focus on what matters. Start with a minimum viable product, another term from the entrepreneurial lexicon. The idea is to get something off the ground now rather than spend two years in, command, in committee trying to plan it. Separate opinions from fact. Everyone's entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. Look at the data. Believe in yourself. Take intellectual risks. Believe that you have the capacity to make things better. Assume you're going to succeed. So what have we learned so far? This interdisciplinary stuff really works. 
The presence of specialists from not my discipline is enriching to all concerned. They bring a fresh perspective completely unfettered by the conventional wisdom from my discipline. They are also unaware of what they're not supposed to be able to do in my discipline, so they just do it. I would also encourage you to avoid triggering the organization's autoimmune response. Louis Manon, in his great book, The Marketplace of Ideas, talking about curricular reform, referred to a certain group of faculty as the T cells of the academy who sought out new ideas wherever they could find them and killed them. <laughs> Former president of Stanford, John Hennessy, famously characterized this as circling the wagons and firing inward. Second, humans are messy. And when we work on human problems, we need colleagues who understand qualitative research that relates to people, populations, and policy. And finally, learn what not to say to senior administrators. For example, telling one or asking one, how can you be so incredibly myopic? Or telling a group of deans, hey, I'm just trying to help you guys, are not ways to win friends. So if you want to know more about InWorks, you're welcome to stop by any time. Uh, you can contact us. You can read about us on the website. If you want to know a lot about InWorks, you can download our white paper, uh, which is linked here. And I'll make sure that whoever collects PDFs and things has, uh, has these slides. So thank you for inviting me to speak. It has been a privilege. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. We have uh, questions at the end of the session for the other lectures, but if there's any questions for Dr. Bennett right now, we could take them right now. I certainly learned a lot. I wish I had a talk like this when I was a much younger investigator. I kind of did the stay in your lane bro uh, investigations, and it really did not help my career as much as it could have. So maybe there's some young people who would want to ask a question or two. Or even old people. Well, the young people would be faster to get to the microphone. Uh, I'm, I'm young and heart. Uh, Dr. Folio from NIH Clinical Center, and uh, we're, I'm interested from the HIMSIM uh, Society, which I'm sure you know about, the uh, Enterprise Imaging Initiative, which is an interdisciplinary uh, effort to try to get dermatology, pathology, the visible light, and the infrared and other uh, types of imaging into a PAX or a VNA. I wonder if you have any experience on that. Direct experience, no, but it sounds like a great idea. Um, you know, it's, I would guess that it would be helpful to have, you know, some facilitation of that. Otherwise, you're going to have, you know, this group of scholars on this table and, you know, everyone's going to sit together with people they know because it's more comfortable. So make them sit somewhere else. Okay. Thank you. Neil? Thanks a lot for that lecture. Um, question is, in the interdisciplinary concept that you're talking about, traditional academic structures are just do not reward that. And the, just the notion of the independent investigator, which is rewarded extraordinarily and is heralded, how do you cope with that at the University of Colorado? Well, that's a really good question. Um, so when I was asked to create this program, uh, I told the chancellor that I needed to report to the provost. And so that I would have the ability to you know, exist as an academic unit without being part of any school or college. Because you, as you probably know, most deans, you know, perhaps wisely view their primary role as resource protection. And so if we were part of one school or college, the other deans wouldn't want to play. By being not part of any school or college, and by eschewing this, the tradition, traditional fiscal things like credit hour production, we were able to move forward and work with Everyone. Do you see that this is something that can disseminate widely, or are you just a lucky guy? Uh, you know, I'd like to think that it could be widely disseminated. And yes, I was a little bit lucky, but I also think it's fair to say that we had some pretty stiff headwinds. And we were able to figure out a way to do it using some of the ideas I've talked about. Thank you. We have time for one more. Jeff? C congratulations on uh, a tremendous program. Uh, I think that having a program like this that is not relying on fee-for-service is tremendous. My question to you is, how do you scale uh, in that <coughs> circumstance, uh, particularly as you build success? 
So our initial funding came from chancellor discretionary funds, uh, and we're moving to a funding model that where you know basically the deans throw a little bit of money into the pot. You know, the entire InWorks budget on both campuses doesn't make the decimal point for the dean of medicine. You know, I, I, I'm just going to say it. You know, he has about $80 million a year in discretionary money. Um, our budget just doesn't make the decimal point. So, you know, you can do a lot with a comparatively small amount of money. But you, you don't anticipate at some point needing more in order to well, expand your reach? So uh, a lot of the things we do, you know, so we have... Not in, I mean, InWorks directly has, you know, some things, uh, you know, IP disclosures and things, but most of what we do is to help others make those disclosures to the technology transfer enterprise. Uh, I anticipate and believe that in, you know, in fairly soon royalties from those endeavors will more than, you know, cover what we're doing. I don't want to be tied to that. But I'd like for the CFO to say, yeah, 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 it works. They're great. Keep funding them. Thank you. Great. Well, I want to thank, want to, on behalf of the society, we want to thank you again for just a wonderful kickoff in this session on much. innovation. And we have a small, oh, you can't get away from us that quick. We have a small token of our appreciation oh for, from the society. Thank you. So it's a tough act to follow, of course, but. Dr. Schnall is re ready for it and has come from, to visit it from Pennsylvania and is going to talk to us as a nice uh, moving forward on this topic with developing a culture of innovation within radiology. Mitch? Thank you and I very much appreciate uh, Dr. Bennett's presentation, very much resonated with me. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the work we've been doing at Penn to try to foster a culture of innovation and, and when I'm talking about a culture of innovation, you know, we do a lot of research at at Penn as well, but I'm not talking about the basic research per se. I'm, I'm really talking about innovation of the clinical practice because we're very frustrated about our ability to translate some of the research ideas and just some general ideas that, you know, of, of how we change practice into practice and so that's something that we wanted to take on. Uh, just my disclosure, of your research grant from Siemens. So first I wanted to ask the question, how innovative are we as a discipline in radiology? Um, clearly, our discipline has changed tremendously over the last 30 years, or, uh, or even, even less than that. Um, we've adopted a number of new technologies since we've started, um, and those technologies have completely reshaped our discipline. So, in some sense, one could claim this, this is innovation. On the other hand, if we look at it a little bit differently from the fundamentals of what we do, um, we, we still do a lot of things very similar to what we did when we started as a discipline. This is a, a radiology report that I uh, was given by Kurt Langlotz uh, from 1896. And the language is a little strange, but basically he said, you know, I don't see any st renal stones, the bones look okay, there are no foreign bodies. You can imagine this today if the language was a little bit different. So in, maybe in some ways we're not so innovative in what we do. Um, Ruben Mesrich, uh, who was a former faculty member of Penn and, and our interim chair, I uh, used to ask him, you know, what, what do you do for a living? He goes, well, I look at a picture and I tell a story. And, and although the tools that we use along that chain have fundamentally changed in an amazing amount during the time in all aspects, um, the fundamentals of what we do, look at a picture and tell the story, still hold. Um, we have a, we have a, a real uh, investment in our individual report language and structure. Um, the, the radiologist owns the entire reporting workflow, so we, we get the image and we output the report and we do all of that in general. Um, and we've got a strong investment in individual brand, right? I like the way my reports look. I like the way my, my, my images look. And that investment um, really uh, makes it difficult to, to layer certain aspects of innovation on. Um, so maybe, maybe there's some things that we, we do that aren't, that aren't as innovative as they could be. Um, so when you study and look at organizations and organizations that innovate, one of the things that um, characterizes these organizations and individuals that are innovative leaders um, is this idea of learning agility. Uh, learning agility, which simply put, is knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. Um, a more detailed description of learning agility, um, it's the ability, ability and willingness to learn from experience and then apply this to first-time experiences. Um, 
maybe one could think of this as using your experience to be comfortable shooting from the hip in some way. Um, that, that's really what learning agility is about. If we look at traditional, ver, traditional uh, thinking versus agile thinking, and by the way, they put this on a spectrum. Traditionals, they call that expert thinking versus agile thinking. You know, conventional intelligence versus quick thinkers. Uh, grades and test scores traditionally versus innovative uh, initiative and curiosity. Fresh connections versus technical skills. Principles, rules and thumbs versus analytical skills. This is really a, a key axis that we, that we think about along this axis. So one of the things that, that we did at Penn is we went around and tried to test ourselves to try to understand a little bit about, so how agile are we? Are we agile thinkers? Um, and there's, a, there's a, uh, an instrument called the Via Edge which tests agility in a number of ways. And, and this is all of the radiology leadership. Uh, we went through and tested our entire leadership on, on how agile they are, thinkers based on the Via Edge. And the, uh, the, the blue dots are faculty leadership, the yellow dots are, are um, administrative leadership. And what you find when you look at this um, is that uh, we're on the expert side, not particularly agile. Yeah, we do have our, our highly agile individuals, but as a discipline, we're on the expert side. If we look at um, medicine in general and academic medicine, most academic medicine, and we tested multiple departments within, the, within Penn, are a little bit on the expert side. Radiology was a little bit expert than most. Actually, the one department that's, that uh, tested a little less agile than us was pathology. And you can imagine pathologists are pretty set in their ways, and so that's not a surprise. So, so our, we don't necessarily have a natural tendency as organizations towards innovation, even though we clearly have innovative people within our department. And I'd suggest that most departments would probably look a little bit like ours. Um, the other thing that's interesting is testing self-awareness. And, and, and if you look at testing self-awareness, we also test on the left side of self-awareness. So we're not quite as aware in terms of how agile we are as we may think we are. We may think we're very agile, we may think we're innovative, more than, than we are by objective measures. And so what we did is we decided we were going to use a deliberate approach to try to cultivate a culture of, of innovation within the department. Um, we're going to start by creating a burning platform. Uh, it's a lot easier to get people to jump off if, if you've got the platform burning. Um, we wanted to prepare our leadership and train our leadership to cultivate innovation. Uh, we established our little mini version of what we just heard in InWorks, we call our Center for Practice Transformation. Um, implement some top-down pilots uh, to get some visibility and then start implementing bottom-up innovation through innovation challenges. So the burning platform. Uh, this is the burning platform that we created, which frankly I believe is correct. Um, I have a whole you know, hour we can talk about these, these issues in, but I'll just give you the highlights of what we, uh, what we tend to push is there's tremendous financial pressure on us in our specialty. I think, frankly, the, 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 the payers have given up trying to manage utilization. They are now going after cost per, and they're going after that hard. Um, we have incredible productivity pressures as a result. We have value pressure. We have to show we're bringing value to the patient, not to us as radiologists, but to our patients and to the healthcare system. And how are we going to show that? Time of care pressure, constantly now having to make decisions that move patients through the medical process, maybe not because of medical emergencies, which are changing some of the pressures on us. And we've got disruptive technologies like information, like artificial intelligence and others coming down that are going to get in the middle of what we do as radiologists, not just on the edges of the technology we use to do what we do. Um, and so considering these trends, I like to make the point, and I believe this to be the case, that the current state of the way we practice radiology is not sustainable, that we have to, we have to completely innovate in the way we think of radiology. Next thing we did is we developed a leadership program. We partnered with uh, an uh, organization that we have on campus called the Penn Medicine Academy, which has a leadership academy. Um, and we basically involved a broad uh, part of our uh, physician and administrative leadership, about 40 people in our department were part of this leadership program. Uh, every individual got a personal leadership coach. Um, and in addition, we ran yearly retreats and, a, and several quarterly programs to deal with some of the issues, frankly, that we heard in the prior presentation. How do you manage teams? How do you build a feedback-rich environment and improve communication? How do you manage change and stop the thousand points of no from, from killing what you want to do and, and, and being the, uh, the immune system of your change? 
Um, decision making, how do you make decisions um, and what's the right amount of data and how deep do you have to go in, in analyzing your decisions and be comfortable with them. Financial management, talent evaluation. So we did a, a, a fair amount of, um, of, of programming to prepare leadership. We then did some, a top-down pilot, and this was the first top-down pilot we did. This was within, frankly, weeks of my taking over as chair. Um, so this is back in 2012, where we developed this idea of, 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 a, of a macro, we call it code abdomen, where essentially it applies a BIRAD code to the solid organs in the abdomen. Um, I can tell you this took a ton of personal, political uh, capital to get this done. Lots of individual dis discussions. I remember having discussions with some of the faculty like, um, well, why do I have to make a decision and make a recommendation on this? I'm like, you're right. The urologist who's taking care of the kidney mass knows a lot about complex cysts of the pancreas, and let them make the decision, right? I mean, who should make the decisions? It took a ton of individual dis discussions at that level in order to get this um, implemented, and we got it implemented um, with, a, with a high degree of um, compliance. So what do we do with that? Um, well, one thing you can do is you can develop benchmarks around quality, right? So for example, if you look to your left, you can see that there's two sets of bar graphs. The one to your left are bar graphs for the, nump, the fraction of reports that in one of the organ systems includes an indeterminate, that is, needs follow-up lesion. And to the right are those that have a suspicious lesion, something that we think is worrisome. Well, needs follow-up is kind of a hedge, right? And those three colors are three different, three different hospitals. Two of them are one place, one of them looks a little different kind of hedging three times as much as the others. Is that a quality measure? I kind of think it is. Um, and it gave us data that we can take on. Another thing that we did is try to take on, and this, and this I know a lot of folks are doing these days, is, is trying to do follow-up reminders to make sure those people who needed follow-up get it. So we automatically mine data off the reports. We generate it into a work list. The work list automatically generates reminders back to providers, hey, you may want to order the follow-up because they may need it. The only problem is providers are getting inputs from all over the place. They tend to ignore reminders that, that come to them. So, so it actually doesn't work quite as well as we'd like it to work. So the next step here is um, actually taking the next step, and that is hiring our own APPs and literally running a virtual results clinic. Literally in collaboration with the Department of Medicine, so we're compliant in terms of managing APPs. They're going to be writing orders. Literally writing orders and following patients until frankly, they need a referral to, uh, to, a, to a specialist. Um, so when a pulmonary nodule gets big enough and needs to go see a pulmonologist, we'll send them to the pulmonologist. Um, so taking that on. Um, our Center for Practice Transformations uh, then started running um, a, uh, a, a bottom-up challenges. And the Center for Practice Transformation includes some expertise in design thinking, some business analytics, uh, some programming support, that we put into this into the center, and it is our version, mini version of, of InWorks that we just heard about. Um, we ran a, a challenge, we got 30 ideas, 10 semifinalists, and two winning ideas, and we do this about every six months now and publicize it quite a bit around the department. Um, an example of, of sort of an, the idea, an idea that came from challenges, this is uh, LiveAware. Uh, Tessa Cook is working on this. The idea here is to automatically scan the medical record for patients that are coming in for encounters with primary care or gastroenterology, looking for patients who may qualify to be screened for HCC, because we know we're, we're not screening as many patients as need to be screened. We pen orders, which then go into the uh, specialists or, or the, uh, the provider's uh, uh, order queue uh, for that, uh, for, for the, uh, for the, hepatocellular carcinoma screening, and then we engage the patients through the patient portal to tell them that they've got this, uh, this, this order and, and offer help in getting them scheduled. Um, so this isn't quite up yet, but it's in the process of being built. I kind of knew we made some progress with, with frankly, this uh, particular project, which um, really was organic and grew on its own. Um, we have a, uh, a little piece of software we run that Michelle Balela, one of our neuroradiologists who also happens to be a computer scientist, ran, which basically compares patients on, who have MS on follow-up 
um, and uh, basically red, the, uh, will outline any new or growing plaques in red, shrinking plaques or smaller plaques in green, and uh, there was a, a every neuroradiologist uses this to read their cases now, and there was a, a poster being presented at our research day showing, boy, if there are no red plaques, you're never going to have an enhancing plaque. So if nothing's growing or nothing's new, you're not going to have an enhancing plaque. So if somebody's standing around the poster, somebody said, well, why do we give people contrast then if they don't have red plaques? And so a, a lot of thinking went on. A self-organized team got together and said, well, how do we do this? And they figured out a way to actually get the, do the T2-weighted images first, send them very quickly to our core lab. They run this analysis. The techs identify no red plaques, call back, and then they, and they don't inject contrast. And uh, this is what the, uh, the flow looks like. You get a T2 scan. While they're scanning, doing some of the other scans, they run the analysis in the core lab. They test if there's progression. They notify the scanner right away if they need contrast. 80% now, 80% of our MS follow-up patients don't get contrast now. Um, and this was recently published in, uh, in JACR. This all happened in six months. Six months from the poster presentation to standard of care at our center. That's when I knew we started having it right. So we've had a number of successes in, 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 uh, in the innovation space uh, from uh, the, the MS project I talked about, a number of things building off of uh, our, uh, our structured reporting system, a, uh, a system to be able to provide uh, uh, a uh, patient um, a language uh, uh, translator for our reports that people see them in our in our uh, patient uh, portal, uh, that's what's called Porter. Um, so we've, we've had a, we've had a, a number of uh, successes along those lines. Um, I will say that, uh, that that building culture is critical. Culture trumps strategy every time. If you've got people coming to work thinking of, thinking that this is what we're here to do and this is how we're going to work, um, that's where we're going to be success. This is really hard to do. It takes a lot of I think intention to get it done. Um, but I think slowly we're, we're trying to break ourselves and move ourselves a little more to the agile side of, of center uh, and trying to develop a little more of a culture of uh, innovation. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent lecture. Continuing our innovation theme, we have the very innovative title for Dr. Griss's lecture of friction in the human world. Human friction. Thank you, Joel. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes talking about creativity. It's something that, uh, it's a capacity that allows us all to create art, uh, develop new technologies, and conduct cutting edge research. And there's been a lot of work on it. And uh, it's been studied in a variety of ways over the years, focused primarily on studying individuals and their individual characteristics and their trajectories, their developmental trajectories for uh, being creative geniuses. And it's often focused on those geniuses that become great scientists, inventors, and famous artists. But despite this, the fact that creativity is often thought of in terms of these uh, creative geniuses, it's also something that's inherent to us all as human beings, and it's shared by us all. And it's expressed in our ability to um, produce new ideas that are useful, like we just thought, saw from uh, Mitch and from uh, John Bennett. So I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes sharing some of the latest kind of often imaging-derived research about creativity and uh, some of the things that we can do to facilitate that. Those are disclosures. So friction. I was actually assigned this title. I think it's to fill the seats of the auditorium. There's been a lot of curiosity about this friction, this title. And uh, friction is a force resisting the relative motion of solid surfaces, fluid labels and uh, layers, and material elements sliding against each other, according to the great omnipresent Wikipedia. 
The result of friction is what's important. When surfaces in contact uh, move relative to each other, it changes the kinetic energy into thermal energy. This creates something new, useful, and often remarkable. An example is this. This was a rock just a few seconds ago traveling through space, a cold, hard rock, which was not very interesting. But when it interacts with the atmosphere of our Earth, it becomes something spectacular. The heat turns to light, and this image was captured over the uh, Loch Ness by John McDonald. So, what does it mean, human friction? Well, spoiler alert, I'm not going to talk about the heat created when two human bodies move against <laughs> each other, Dr. Reeder. But I will, I will talk about the energy liberated when human beings interact with one another. So clearly, we are stewards of this amazing technology, CT and MR, that has changed the world. Uh, really, uh, in a survey of internal medicine uh, physicians, it was identified as the most uh, impactful innovation in the last hundred years. And that's clearly recognized by the number of publications in MR, and Dr. Eamon will be talking about patents later, and clearly incredible productivity. However, there's some concerns, there's some storm clouds on the horizon. And that is that uh, E.P. Torrance has been studying, and his colleagues have been studying these uh, groups of children uh, since 1958, Minnesota children, and they're able to look at the creativity of those children over the years. And in the last 20 years, there's been a measurable drop in creativity of our children. This uh, led to Newsweek uh, calling it a creativity crisis. I'm not going to go into this because it really gets kind of depressing, less emotionally expressive, less energetic, less talkative, yada, yada, yada. It's a concern. So how can we change that in our own field? And I'm going to talk about two things we can do as individuals and then a few things we can do as leaders in our academic medical centers and in our departments. So how do we promote individual creativity? Well, the first thing is to make time for alpha waves. This is, well, let me ask you, how many of you have had a great idea in the shower? Raise your hand. Okay, it's, it's about half, half of the individuals here. This is about divergent thinking. It's about letting your right brain do the thinking and letting these uh, alpha waves burst forward. And in fact, there's science to go on to go with this. This is the aha moment. The left brain is the uh, organizational executive functions, the right brain more the creative functions. And uh, send her and colleagues noticed that there's a burst of alpha waves in the right hemisphere about eight seconds before an individual even knows they come to the solution to a problem. They've been able to measure this. It awakens the remote associations in the right hemisphere and spotlights uh, inward. This has been uh, supported by imaging research, which shows in this comparison by Fink between higher creative individuals and lower creative in individuals, a difference in the right hemisphere alpha wave activity that um, is measurable and demonstrable. I did an unofficial poll when I gave the precursor to this talk at the ISMRM, and I asked our gold medalists uh, about where they got their ideas. They had an average H index of 41, average number of publications of 174, and a lot of them had their good ideas in the shower before going to work. Actually, uh, uh, just, well, nine of them actually in my unofficial poll. So uh, this has been embraced, and I think it's useful for us to embrace. Uh, Private industry has embraced this. Uh, 3M uh, masking tape was developed this way. Google, uh, things like Gmail, Google Earth were developed by allowing people some unstructured time in their 
schedules and in their work to pursue these ideas. So therefore, I think it's critical that in academic medicine, we preserve that academic time at a minimum 20%. And as Fred Lee suggested yesterday, it's really important to preserve it from the duck bites of all the other compliance stuff that we have to do and to make sure that there's opportunity for innovation. And I think uh, for those of you in private practice, I think it's worthwhile to ask your colleagues, how are we all spending time off of the clinical service in uh, the interest of improving our practice? Now, in Wisconsin, we do this in a way that was um, spearheaded a number of years ago, catching alpha waves at the UW Practical Imaging and Intervention Meeting, AKA the Fishing Meeting, where we all go up to Canada and uh, spend time lecturing to each other and going fishing. And uh, you can see our program chair here, Dr. Reeder, uh, joining me, uh, Beth Burnside, and of course, Fred Lee. This meeting makes us all happy and relaxed, and we have generated more than $13 million worth of grants as a result of this meeting. And uh, uh, is Fred here? You know, yesterday he was talking about Dr. Reeder. Well, there you see him, he's the unhappy one there. And uh, 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 yeah, payback, Fred, for your uh, expose on Dr. Reeder. Um, but this meeting actually makes him really happy and relaxed. We have a good time, and there's been a lot of good that's come out of it. The second category of things I'd like to talk about is preparing the prefrontal cortex, and this is a convergent thinking. This is sweat, sadness, and failure, and it's all about writing grant proposals. And uh, this is really reflected in what uh, Dr. Bennett was talking about, the importance of team science. Teams are getting bigger. Papers with more offers are being demonstrated, including at the successful NIH uh, programs with the uh, papers associated with our series funding demonstrate an increasing number of authors over time. And this is really all about the interdisciplinary collaboration. And it's not, all, all these uh, creative thoughts are not these alpha wave driven epiphases, but they leverage working memory. They leverage the prefrontal cortex and they let the left brain converge on solutions and suppress some of the right brain activity in this case. This has been demonstrated using fMRI. Benedict did this. And um, what they showed is that there's this area of the prefrontal cortex, the, uh, the inferior uh, gyrus there that is enhanced and activated and the, the um, the right parietal region and the uh, parietal gyrus is relatively suppressed. When you get these people working, especially in response to external forces that are challenging their thoughts, it's this constructive thinking. And so I think the message here is it's really important to come to meetings like this and have dialogue and have debates. You can't replace that in-person uh, response. My own experience in this started in the AUR in 1984, a debate that I was asked to attend on the behalf of CTA versus MRA versus Doppler ultrasound. And there I was, positioned between Jeff Rubin, who had just started doing CTA, and Jonathan Rubin, who just started doing color flow, power Doppler imaging of blood flow. And here I was with my little MRA technique, 2D time of flight, which really wasn't very good. I didn't have much, except for more hair at that time. And I left that debate pummeled, totally annihilated by Jeff and Jonathan. I felt like the sauerkraut in a Rubin sandwich, actually. <laughs> So I went back and I, uh, that's just when Martin Prince, who's also here, just developed contrast enhanced MRA, which borrowed from CTA to develop a morphologic image of the blood vessels that are flow independent. And uh, this was great. And I uh, went back to our research group and said, hey, let's combine this anatomic and functional test and let's develop this uh, time resolved MRA, which gives us some anatomic as well as functional information about vascular disease. And that proved to be a pivotal moment in my career. And it was all about that debate between the two Rubens. 
Okay, then finally in the last few minutes, how can we uh, promote innovation and promote human friction within our departments and within our research groups? Three things. First of all, embracing the outsider. There's some really interesting data on this. The world is filled with natural outsiders. We call them young people. And they have good ideas because they're new to the field and they're unencumbered by uh, tradition. Gamera et al. studied this in a brilliant study of Broadway musicals. He could determine the successful ones and the flops. And he tracked those over time. And he tracked the uh, creative teams that created those musicals. And he measured this, he created this measure called the Q, which was a, kind of the social intimacy familiarity index. And he showed that if individual artists were unfamiliar with each other, they struggled to work together, those tended to be flops. If they were too familiar with, with each other, then they were insular and those uh, musicals tended to be flops. And you really wanted to be on this uh, kind of peak of this inverted U-shaped curve. So embracing outsiders. The second thing is to support our open source development. And here we've learned from uh, Felix Worley, who's at University of Pennsylvania and a several decades long serial innovator in MRI. He worked for GE at one time in, in 1998. Uh, really, the manufacturers had a closed source system. The trade secrets were kept within CT and DSA and ultrasound. He advocated, and he said to Maury Blumenfeld, then the leader of GEMR, he advocated that there's a lot of NMR knowledge outside of the manufacturers that could be very useful, and despite uh, the concerns from other individuals, they convinced to go to open source, and that was when Dick Eamon showed up on their doorstep and showed them that it was possible to eliminate pulsatile artifacts from blood flow using MR, and they said, we have to leverage this expertise outside of our resources. Finally, very briefly, there's a lot of data about urban friction, and that is that cities work because it increases the likelihood of these spontaneous interactions. The creativity index goes by the population to a slightly higher than one exponent, and this is where we really benefit from meetings like this. If the RSNA is like the New York City of imaging, it's meetings like this that create more of a Greenwich Village. We saw that Saturday night at the Ted Like Talks where there was an intimate and close interaction. And this is extremely helpful and to the junior uh, people in the audience, this can be an amazingly productive way to uh, get exposure to your ideas and critical appraisal of that. This has also been well documented by putting people together that uh, the citation index for authors who are in the same building are higher than the authors in different cities or uh, within the same city. And this led to our development of our research center where we've taken the imaging equipment and both radiologists and medical physics, physicists, chemists, and others, and we have embedded them together with offices intermixed and next door to each other to encourage those spontaneous interactions. And we're still trying to put coffee in the middle of it. Um, so this really helps, and you saw some of the results yesterday, like with the work that Meg Lubner showed, and by bringing the equipment there, it encourages the faculty to come there and interact with each other. So in summary, enhancing innovation, make time for alpha waves as individuals, leverage the hard work and horizontal sharing of this interdisciplinary science, and then facilitate human friction by embracing the outsider, support for open source environments, and co-locating interdisciplinary teams. If we do this, we will improve human health for centuries to come. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, that was a fantastic lecture, and now I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Eamon, who is one of the innovators of MRE elastography, has over 40 patents, and is gonna be talking to us about Pasteur's Quadrant, innovation in medical imaging. Thank you very much. And really, this is about your story. It's about the unique characteristics of the innovation that has taken place in your field. 
And I'm going to start with this image here, which uh, is called, which is a painting that was first uh, displayed in 1891 by and by an artist named Luke Fildes. It was called the Doctor. It's been said that there's been this has had more impact than any other piece of art on the perception of the role of the physician. Uh, and uh, you could go ahead and read about it. I won't go into it, but uh, Phildes had been, had, his son Philip had died a few years before, and he had been so impressed with the quiet compassion of the doctor who took care of his son, even though he died, that he, that he uh, partly motivated to make this painting. But okay, so this is a physician in Victorian era, uh, makeshift bed, a child sick, parents in the background. Um, but what's going through this physician's mind? Uh, probably a lot to do with what's what is, exactly is going on here? And what does this physician have in his uh, capacity to, to try to understand what's taking place? He could take a history, but then the rest of it is his census. That's all he had at that point in time was his census. And uh, to, to try and figure out what's going on, sense of touch, the sense of, of uh, hearing, the uh, sight. And the remarkable thing about this is that just three years later, there was a discovery and that discovery was by Röntgen. It gave us, in medicine, a new form of sight. And the remarkable thing about it is that's what established our field. So our field in medicine, what we do, was really has its origin in a singular discovery or invention. And I think that has happened over and over again in our field, and maybe we don't celebrate that enough. And of course, we have these remarkable technologies available to us that this physician could only have been, could never even have imagined. And it's had an extraordinary impact in, in our practice. And in many times, we have to remind ourselves of the impact. And imagine just a few years, uh, a few decades ago, um, post moon landing, if, if you, uh, uh, someone you cared about was in an, a car accident and had it head um, blowed in the car accident, came into the emergency department, a little bit of altered consciousness, a uh, little drowsiness, what are they worried about? They're worried about an epidural hematoma, which is going to basically press on the brain, stop the, per, per, the perfusion, the patient might die. Um, there's no skull fracture here, but it doesn't necessarily rule it out. So it's, it's just amazing to think that a few years ago, just a few years ago, the diagnostic uh, technique of choice, that the only thing that was really available was to drill holes in the skull to see whether or not there was blood there. This is just amazing in most of our lifetime. And this is basically the same primitive procedure that was performed 8,000 years ago. And really, uh, so it, we now know, take for granted that we can look inside tomographically and see whether or not there is a collection of blood. So this is a remarkable change. And where have these advances come from? The first point I'm going to make is that these advances have come from multidisciplinary or, uh, teams. And in particular, in, radi in, in imaging, the, our teams are kind of unique because they bring together biomedicine, science and biomedicine, with physics, math, and engineering. And if you look at the major modalities, the discoveries, the, the tools that we have now available to do, that you have, to do the good you do for patients, most of those are rooted in this kind, these kinds of multidisciplinary teams. For example, radiology brought this to medicine. Now, this is one of the few audiences that would, would rec recognize what this is. But this has been called the most important algorithm of our lifetime by, by the American Society of Engineering. And, um, and yet, most audiences wouldn't recognize what this is. This, of course, is the data flow diagram for the fast Fourier transform, which was originally discovered during the Cold War uh, to do seismic uh, analysis to detect underground explosions in the Soviet Union, but really uh, in radiology. And then it became at the root of most of modern communications, many uh, types of sig di digital signal processing are based on the, this particular algorithm. And, uh, and in, in, in medicine, the first, one of the first areas this was used was in our imaging technologies. So many of our advances have been inventions. Now, who are the inventors? Well, of course, we think for CT and MRI, these are early CT and MR images, we think of these people who won Nobel Prizes, Hounsfield and Cormac for CT, Laudeber and Mansfield for MRI. But the reality is, these technologies have been reinvented many times over since those first discoveries. These, we can do things with these technologies that, would, that the original inventors would scarcely have imagined. And so that, that's an important point, is we are continuing the process of reinvention of these technologies. 
Another aspect of innovations in medical imaging that we probably should pay more attention to, and we heard it already in this session, is the rapid rate of translation from discovery to practical use. Um, so uh, it, in, in the pharmaceutical industry, it takes at least 12 years to go, typically to go from discovery of a drug to it's in your medicine cabinet. In the case of medical imaging innovations, the, the translation is so much faster. And it started, of course, with, with the discovery of the X-ray. The radiography here in 1895 was published then. And all over the world, within a, a year or so, it was being used in medical care. And this in a small uh, rural community called Rochester, Minnesota, 14 months later, here's a child who had swallowed a buckle and they used this technology to find out where this was. And you can see it against the sternum there. And we saw that many times over. This is Mansfield's uh, uh, Hounsfield's proof of concept for the CT scanner. He built this thing by himself in, in 1969. And we, here we see, just a few years later, 1973, the first commercial CT scanners becoming available. Radical, very rapid translation. And we've seen that over and over again, where discoveries, for instance, in MRI, like you see here, fast gradient echo, MRI and geography, parallel imaging, these have been translated from basic discovery, from from an invention to clinical care very, very rapidly. We should celebrate that more in our area. Another special aspect of research in our field and innovation, which isn't widely appreciated, which we, again, we should emphasize, particularly to people who, who are legislators or people who, who decide on where we should fund research, is that there's an extraordinary return on investment. Now, how can I show that to you? Well, one area I can show that to you is in the area of inventions that come from research. Now, until about 25 years ago, we didn't have a home for our research in our field at the NIH. And as you know, the NIH has multiple institutes, about 30 or so. And at, until that time, there was no place for our science, uh, imaging science. And it was the creation of NIBIB, the National Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering, that really gave us a home for our science uh, uh, at this important place. And, uh, and, and as you know, there are these institutes, I mentioned those already, and what we're going to look at here is talking about inventions, inventions coming from funded research. And these are important, not just because they represent solutions to problems, but also they're, they're the origin of economic activity, which is, again, something we can use to convince legislators to provide funding for our, uh, for our uh, research in our field. And there's an organization that advocates for research in our field, and that's called the Academy of Radiology Research. I had a chance to be associated with that organization, and we did some interesting studies, and we looked at inventions, patents, coming out of funded NIH research to see what the productivity would be. This information was publicly available, widely available, and yet had never really been used. And of course, when you find something like that, it probably means there's winners and losers, and uh, you should look to see who are the winners. So we actually uh, published that originally in uh, Nature Biotechnology. We did a follow-up study uh, funded by our, our, which was published by the Manhattan Institute. And in fact, this was a 19, uh, 2017. That actually led to some interest even in the Wall Street Journal, and we were asked to write an op-ed on this information. So you can look this up sometime. But just to tweak your interest, it says, what does Trump have in common with the National Institutes of Health? Patents. So we can look, look that up. In any case, what we found was that if you look at inventions resulting from NIH-funded research, here I'm showing you all these different institutes, and I'm showing you on a logarithmic scale the patent inv inventions per $100 million invested. These are solutions to problems resulting. These are productivity for inf investment in research. And you can see that the average was 5.5 patents per $100 million invested. Actually, that's not very impressive. But look at our si the, the, the home of our science. It's right up there at the top. So, so th this is an important thing. And how often have you heard about that? It's really amazing that we haven't heard more about that. Now, another way to look at the inventions is to see how Im important they are. And one way to assess the importance of inventions is to look at something called forward citations, which are the number of future patents that cite an exi an a given invention. So a an invention that has many future citations is a new area of science and is more important, likely, than one that doesn't have that. So when we actually analyzed it that way, we actually found, once again, that the home of our science, NIBIB, stands out very well compared with most of the other areas of science at the NIH. How often have you heard about that? Um, and another thing, an analysis we did, which looked at the same methodology used by the Human Genome Project to look at its 
uh, um, downstream benefit. If you invest $1 in, uh, uh, in research at the NIH and look at the downstream economic impact of the inventions, it's about $6, as you can see uh, on average. But in the case of NIBIB, there's actually $33 of downstream economic impact. So how often have you heard that? These are things that characterize uh, innovation in our field, and we need to remember them and capitalize on them. Now, I'd like to kind of just talk a little bit about, oh, and then we can validate that by looking at uh, inventions coming from NIH-funded Nobel Prize winners, and you can see they're in the same region of this figure. And you can look at other government, government agencies. There's DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, famed for its, its uh, success in, in innovating and, and creating new inventions. And one of the things in this article that they talked about, its success, has been the fact that it is focused on something called Pasteur's Quadrant. And I'd like to finish this presentation by just telling you about what that is. And I'm going to start with this guy. His name was Vannevar Bush. He was an engineer and inventor submarine detection research in World War II, co-founder of something that eventually became Raytheon. Uh, he patented one of the first computers uh, invented in, in 1935, but he was asked during the Second World War to head up something called the Office of Scientific Research and Development, which was really the agency that harnessed American science to help win the, the, the World War, or at least survive the World War. And for instance, he oversaw almost all the US R&D operations, including the Manhattan Project. This is an, a letter written by Roosevelt to him in the closing, in the, it, just before the war had ended, so it, the, before the Normandy invasion. And it's a remarkable letter. You can look it up on the internet, but I'd like to just draw the, your attention to these sentences. He, even in these dark days, he pointed out that the annual deaths in this country from one or two diseases alone are far in excess of the total number of lives lost by us in this war. And he asked Bush to, decide, to, to do a study to figure out what should American science be doing after the war to bring the same benefits to health care that could be brought in other areas of science, other areas that are needed, uh, that applying the same uh, techno the approaches that were used during the war. And he came up with this thing called Science the Endless Frontier. You probably heard of the, about this. Um, this is a, a remarkable essay, but I think it actually took us on the wrong track, and I'll explain why. He, he's the first guy, person to use the term basic research, which championed curiosity-driven inquiry, where you have independence from, from, shielded from accountability in many ways, and that these ideas have dominated science policy since 1945. And if you, at your university, if you're at a university, not all of you are, what's the most prized form of research? It's basic research. It, and yet, in, and, and I can say that in largely the, tech, the advances that we've seen in our field have not been in this category we call basic research. So there's this guy uh, named Donald Stokes, who unfortunately died shortly after he published this book called Pastor's Quadrant, and he raised questions about this basic notion that, that we should start with basic research and event, make discoveries, and then we will end up with things that can improve hum, human uh, life. And he really questioned that linear model, and he didn't question separating those things, and he came up with this two-dimensional view of scientific progress, which I'm going to see, show you right here. I'm about three slides from the end of this presentation. He categorized research according to its emphasis on fundamental understanding. In other words, how much are you trying to generate new human knowledge, yet low or high? And how much are you trying to be relevant to an immediate application? How much are you trying to solve a problem? And he gave these quadrants names. He called this quadrant Bohr's quadrant, because Bohr, after all, was just concerned about understanding how the universe worked. How did the atom work? He didn't really care about the applications. It turned out being very important, but he wasn't trying to solve a practical problem. Very important research, it was basic research. And he called this quadrant Edison's quadrant, because Edison just wanted a better filament. He didn't care about advancing human knowledge. He just wanted a better product. He wanted to solve problems. But then he drew attention to this quadrant here, which, is, which he called use-inspired research, which brings together basic research, applied research, and everything else, puts it all together into a multidisciplinary situation, and he called this Pasteur's quadrant. Pasteur, of course, discovered many, many things, but almost everything had a practical use. You know, vaccination, he was one of the fathers of germ theory, uh, food, processing food to preserve it. Many industries were founded based on his discoveries. And I don't know what you, if you have ideas on who should be in this quadrant, I don't know, but we could talk about that. So let, just wrapping this up, it's interesting to look at this diagram and really I th actually think that 
research in our, that advances in our field are often in Pasteur's quadrant because if you think about it, patent inventions are, are solutions to problems, whereas this other axis is really the, the extent to which it has advanced humans, human knowledge. So, and, uh, and we brought that, that to, to medicine. So how can we define the future and what, how will, what innovations will occur in our field? They'll probably be based on capitalizing, capitalizing on our unique strengths, which is our use-inspired innovation strategy. We have this rapid translation to patient care, historic record of high impact, advances are often inventions, they're fueled by technology, and we, have, we, we, in, we embrace multidisciplinary team science, and we have a high return on investment. So once again, again, I, as this, a physician could, could scarcely have imagined what we have now. I think that if we go 100 years forward, we, will, we probably can't imagine what we'll be able to do because of this uh, form of innovation that occurs in our field. Thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you um, for that excellent talk. And our, we're going to round out our session with Dr. Matsumoto, also from Mayo Clinic. And she's going to be speaking on From Bench to Bedside. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for having me. Um, this is a real honor <clears throat> to be speaking here, and especially after all these esteemed speakers. Um, they're wonderful. I still remember meeting Dr. Grist in Sweden, and he was riding his bike through the hills, I think getting a sweat going so he could have great thoughts. Um, but anyway, um, I, I really just really want to share what we've done at Mayo um, with 3D printing. And uh, I think it highlights some of the comments made before about innovation. Um, not that we intended to do anything innovative, we just were working on patient care. And my belief is that a lot of really successful innovation is done in an answer to clinical care. So if there's a clinical problem and you can figure out a way to make it better, that's what's going to be successful. It isn't finding a solution and then looking for the problem. Um, all right. I have no disclosure. So this is a scanner that um, Dr. Eamon was talking about. It's at Mayo Clinic, if you ever want to see it. It looks like kind of a Model T car. It was originally called an EMI scanner. And I, do you guys know what EMI means? Um, so it's electrical musical industry. And that was the first company that Hounsfield worked for that developed the CT scanner. They were also the company that the Beatles played for. They were their record label. So they had a lot of money. Um, some of the money went to develop the CT scan. So whenever I see the CT scan now, I think of the Beatles and this among many other good things that they've done. So this was an Emmy scan and the first studies were called Emmy studies. And I don't know how many people remember that, but like Dr. Eamon said, this was within our lifetime. This scanner was being used when I was in medical school and everybody thought it was the greatest thing ever. So it wasn't in antiquities, you know, it's within my lifetime. And so I think for you guys in your lifetime, you're gonna, the young people, you're gonna see those kind of changes being made too. They're really just exponential. Um, and this is our T CT scanner now. It can get, you know, thousands of bits of data within seconds and reconfigure them in any kind of way and do multiple phases at one time. So really the advancement is amazing. Well, this is the first 3D printer and the first patent was in 1983. Um, it looks like something that somebody invented in their garage or on the kitchen table. Um, and this was rapid prototyping. It, was, it, it used, used computer-assisted design to assemble successful, successive layers of thin material in an additive fashion to create solid three-dimensional projects. And I always think, who thought of that? I am a very concrete person. I would never think of that. But once something like that is developed, then people can think of ways to use it. And so that was in 1983, this is today. Now, patents have expired, people, technologies have developed in 3D printing, and there's all types of 3D printers available in all prices, different resolution, different colors, different materials, just a lot of choices out there. So as computer technology advanced, um, there was this convergence of 3D printing and high resolution imaging. And they came together, and this is kind of what we do in 3D printing medical models. Um, so you have, you have high resolution data, you segment that, and I'll show you that in a, mi in a minute. Um, and then you convert that segmentation, which is separation of different structures that you want to print in different colors, and you convert it into an STL file, and that's really a mesh. You've created a mesh, 
Um, and then you take that and you um, clean it up so it's, the mesh is made out of triangles. This is one thing I learned. It's all triangles. It's all about triangles. And you have to clean up the triangles. Then you put them in the 3D printer. The 3D printer takes that mesh, uses the computer in it, slices it into thin layers, and then directs the printer to put it down. Um, and then you always have to clean the models, and then you give them to the surgeon. And those are kind of the steps within it. Um, so I'll show you the segmentation next. And I always think this goes back to kindergarten. If you can draw between the lines and use different colors, you're good to go. Um, and this is something radiologists do all the time. We look at anatomic structures. You know, where's the outline of them? What's this? What's that? And then you kind of fill them in with colors. And I would say this is one thing I think that must generate a lot of alpha waves because people that do it really get in the zone. Um, it's really kind of a relaxing thing. And you get there and, you know, you go through layer by layer, you segment it out, you're creating something. It really it brings out the artistic ability in a lot of people. So here's the segmentation. This is a renal tumor. Um, first we do the, and we use multi-phase imaging for this, but we do the collecting system, we do the veins, the arteries, the kidney parenchyma, and then the tumor. And there it is. And you think, gosh, that's pretty simple. Is that, how helpful is that? you would be surprised. You give that to a surgeon and it's amazingly helpful. Um, you give it its life size, it shows the anatomy that they need to know about, and they find that incredibly helpful. Um, and this has, we say if we have a DICOM image, we can print it. You want high resolution DICOM images, but, th but that's really the language that we're talking. You take the DICOM image, you export it into segmentation software, you end up printing that segmentation software, and it has found utilization at our institute really within every sub every subspecialty area. Um, and so here, I'm just gonna show you some clinical examples of this. And this is really how we grew. We, we didn't go out and advertise. Um, one of the things we did is we, we had our 3D printing lab in the hospital, so surgeons used to walk by and see it, and, and I think that you're surrounded by so many smart people in medicine. If you give them a tool, they can think of how they can use that tool to solve a problem. So they think of things that we wouldn't think of, but they come and they say, can you do this? Can you do that? And we always say, yeah, we can try to do that. And I think that's one key thing. You always are ready to try. Yeah, we'll try. We'll do it. We'll see what it looks like. And then you're always amazed at when and how that can be helpful. So this is a patient who had a carcinoid tumor in their lung, and the surgeon wanted to do a subsegmentectomy. It was right by the spine. Um, so this is a segmentation that we did, pulmonary arteries, veins, bronchi, and spine. This was the um, virtual 3D file that we made. This was the actual file that we made. And this is, um, this is the actual model that we made. Um, this is the pleura in there. Um, and this is the tumor at surgery. Um, and so this they found really helpful so that they got clean margins. Um, and that they knew exactly where they were. So it, it really helps with localization for them. This is another one. This is a patient who had an invasive chest wall breast cancer. So this was a virtual image. This is the, um, the mesh that we made. And one time when you put this together, you know, you really, some of your artistic and engineering ability comes out because you just can't print this anatomy and have it hold together in the printer, you've got to say, how can I put this together so it helps them the most? How can I put this together so it doesn't fall apart when I take it off the printer? How can I do this so they can lay it somewhere and it, and it doesn't tip or topple over? So there's all those things that come into it. And what colors can I make it so that it's, you know, it's really most evident, the anatomy that I'm showing? So this was the final model that we showed. These were positive nodes out in the axilla. This was the back of that model. So we did internal mammary arteries and veins to show where they are. And then we, because we had already created this, we did another model. This one, we just put the sternum in and we showed that erosive lesion in the sternum. So once you have all this data, you can slice it and dice it and print it any way you like. And part of this also takes the radiologist's knowledge. I mean, I think engineers are great and they can help you with a lot of this, but it really takes the radiologist not just to segment that complex anatomy, but to figure out how am I gonna display this that is most helpful for the surgeon. And you have to work with the surgeon for that too. What do they need? What's important to them? So it really takes a lot of people working together. These are some of the early um, models that we did. These are for scoliosis patients. We have a lot of patients that have complex anomalies of their spine. They're not easy to do surgery on. They're high-risk surgery. This is one of our early users, Dr. Tony Stanzi's Pete's Orthopedics. 
His um, office really literally has 3D models of spines all over the place. Um, he takes them, all of our models go to the OR, even if they're not sterilizable. People use them for reference during surgery. It's much easier to look at this model than it is to have a scan up and start looking through individual slices. So they use them as reference. They're all um, life size, which is also a very important thing. Um, they're really good for interdisciplinary complex surgery. So this is a patient who had morcios. He had marked tracheal stenosis. He had his innominated artery, which was laying over the trachea. Um, he had uh, kyphosis. Um, he had complex vascularity. So we had the Pete's ENT surgeon, the Pete's cardiac surgeon, the Pete's ortho surgeon. We made a couple different models for them. They would look at them. They would make decisions. They did the first surgery, which was um, fixation of the spine. Then we made another model after that was done to look like, OK, now what does the trachea look like? Now what does the vessel look like? And then they did the surgery for that. And he's actually the first child with Marcos that's had this multidisciplinary surgery that survived it. Um, so in the, in the model was only one tool that helped these people with just this terrific expertise decide on their um, focus of their surgery, make decisions, and it really helped in the discussion. And that's one thing you find. Even though you know, these models are just a tool, when you see the surgeons discussing them, they're, they're all looking at the same model. They're all seeing the same thing. They hold it in their hands. They turn it around. They say, I'm going to come in here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. In fact, I like to say when we have these models, we give them to the surgeons. We start showing them. The surgeons take them, quit talking to us, and start talking to the model. They look at it, they turn it, they, they start talking about what they're going to do. And every surgeon does the same thing. So I always think those neural networks between their hands and their brains are just really lighting up when they get this physical model in their hands. Um, so th one of the other things that the models are helpful for is when you have high stakes resection. This is a um, horseshoe kidney, had a big carcinoid tumor here, and they wanted to resect it but be able to save that right side of the kidney so that the patient wouldn't have to go on dialysis or have a transplant. So this was a, a tumor that had thrombus in the renal vein. It had thrombus in the iliac artery. A big thing when they do these surgeries, you know, is the collecting system. You want to be able to preserve that collecting system on that side that you're saving. So we made this model for them. Again, they used it in the OR. This is kind of a neat picture on the side. One of the other things we do is you can surface scan. I don't know how many people know about that. You know, using cameras, lights, you can surface scan things and get the resolution, the contour, the color, and you can 3D print it. So this was actually a surface scan of that carcinoid tumor in that kidney that we 3D printed life-size after the surgery. So really a, a number of great educational things that go along with 3D printing. This is a choreostoma in a one-year-old. This family had come from the Middle East. Um, and come all the way to Mayo to have this resected. Um, so this is, again, a really complex tumor. It was going through the orbit. It was going under the orbit. It was eroding. There was vessels all on top of it. This was a multidisciplinary surgery. And again, we printed multiple different models to give them different looks at this tumor so that they could help them with their surgery. And after surgery, we just, you know, they came and they said, you know, this made such a difference for us to get a total resection for this child. And, and I would have to say, people that work in the lab, this is what kind of keeps us going, because there's a number of nights and weekends you spend there. But when you hear about this kind of impact that the models have for patients, you're just like, yes, we'll, we'll just keep doing what we're doing because it makes a difference, it makes an impact. And I think almost everybody that works in 3D printing sees this. Here's a cardiac model. Here's a baby with an ectopic heart. Um, and we made that model to help them plan surgery. Um, this is one for stent placement, so um, the cardiac surgeon or the vascular surgeon actually um, practiced, here he has a thoracic aneurysm. We made a model, the thoracic vascular surgeon practiced placing a stent in that model, and then he went across the way and placed a stent in the patient. Um, so this is a very surgically driven practice. Um, it, it, the models increase comprehension of complicated anatomy for the surgeons. It helps them decide their surgical approach. It helps them with multidisciplinary discussions to rehearse procedures and for interoperative reference. This is the um, growth of the models at Mayo. And this kind of follows the innovation curve. And we think we're really right here on that innovation. Um, now, the other thing I want to talk about just for a minute is 
virtual surgical planning. So not only can you make models for them to look at, you can use that same data. The surgeons come in, this is an ENT surgeon um, speaking with our um, engineer, it was the first engineer, biomedical engineer hired by radiology, we now have two. The surgeon comes in, decides where he's gonna make a cut um, based on the design, based on the um, patient's anatomy. Our biomedical engineer then makes a guide that they can place on that patient in the OR so they make those same cuts um, during the OR. So it make, helps them decide ahead of time where they're gonna cut, and then you have this guide that helps them do that. Um, so here's for, this. that was a mandibulectomy. Here's for a fibular free flap, the guide that's made. Um, here's the guide for the mandible. Here's the 3D printed model afterwards that has those fibular uh, segments in it and they can bend the plate around it. Um, these are just, again, pictures of this. And I would have to say the surgeons absolutely love this. I mean, the ENT surgeons are just, we do a number of these every week, and I think this is part of the future of 3D printing, to make guides. Um, so what about guides? Um, that's something that, you know, we haven't done before. It's been done by industry. Um, FDA has had oversight over that. And now, you know, the whole question is, how about in-house guides? Um, and so this is a lot of discussions going on now with the FDA and the 3D printing community under, you know, what kind of a landscape do we do this under? So this is actively being discussed. So I just want to um, make one more comment about um, the FDA and the RSNA. Dr. Eamon has, was really instrumental in helping us form a 3D printing special interest group in the RSNA. And that has grown from 50 members to over 450 members. It's a place for people to get together and talk and have initiatives. And so we have constant discussions with the FDA um, about these kind of things. And it's just this very active group. And the other thing then that that group has done um, is we worked with the ACR. And I would just have to say um, I have such um, gratitude um, to the ACR because we um, went to them with you know 3D printing and trying to get a code because one of the biggest things I think that have, has held back 3D printing is the reimbursement. It's a question we always get. How do you get it reimbursed? Well, we um, worked with the ACR and, the, and the, it was kind of like plugging into a spaceship that just took off. They have so many really dedicated, skilled professionals. It was amazing. So we talked to them in 2017 um, by 2018, there was a category three CPT code, um, and that's re voluntarily reimbursable, but it's on the road to get, getting reimbursed. There's actually four codes. Two of them are for models, two of them are for guides. And then the other thing that happened is the RSNA and the ACR came together and helped us develop a registry, and it's a registry for these 3D printed models so that people can, um, will start putting that data into this registry, which is gonna be monitored by the ACR, and it can be used for research and for um, going for a category one code later. So these are all things I think that um, have been amazing in the last couple of years that have developed. They wouldn't have developed without support from radiology organizations. And I think I have become just so much more cognizant of how important being involved in those organizations is just to help you move forward. So it's been a really great experience. Um, and I just wanna say one other thing, I know I'm a little bit over time, but the other big impact that 3D printing had is, a, a, is on education. The models can be used for education, but they can also be used to create simulation models. And there's such a huge demand now for people to practice, for residents to practice procedures on models or on something before they practice them on a patient. So you can use 3D printing to create models to practice on. This is one, um, Dr. Odrich again, he has his um, fellows practice on um, our vascular models, they can practice placing stints under fluoro before they have to do it on a patient. It makes him happy that they're practicing not on patients but on models. This is a, a model that we made for inguinal hernia repair for the surgeons. So we 3D printed a pelvis and then we molded different skin, different layers, the internal oblique, the external oblique, the fascia, the subcutaneous tissue, and the skin over it. It's kind of like cooking and did I think when I was in radiology I would be doing something like this? No. But do I enjoy it? Everybody enjoys it, it's great. So we made these models with the surgeons. We would never know exactly what to put in this model. We put it in and they use it to train their surgical residents. They've already had two sessions on how to do inguinal hernia repairs. Um, one of the residents is also taking this um, to a global mission to teach in Africa, in sub-Saharan Africa, how to do hernia repairs. 
So, um, and this is another one. This was a um, thoracic model to practice chest tube placement. Um, and this is what the residents in um, Sub-Saharan Africa had used before to practice. And now Dr. Moyer, who, who works at Mayo and goes over there, 20% of his time is taking these models over. So I think it's one of those areas that once you get involved, it's amazing um, the number of places it can go, the, the amount of impact it can have. Um, and again, in medicine, you're surrounded by so many smart people. When you, you know, have, if they have this opportunity to use it, you can go so many places to help care. So this is the new convergence. It's, and you know, it's been emphasized before. If you can get out of silos and go into radiology, surgery, and engineering, I think you make great advances. So thank you very much. Quick announcement, um, we're going to have the Q&A uh, next. Uh, we've got about five minutes before the break, but during the break from 3 to 3.15, if there are committee members, um, anyone interested, fellow or member, the committee chairs will be in there. We'd really like you to join. There's a number of committees that are open, education, curriculum, um, membership, bylaws. Thanks. So if there's a few quick questions for our speakers, um, you should feel free to abuse them during the break also. I'm sure they're not appreciative of me saying that, but... That's fine, too. You guys want to come up, or no? I they're tired from innovating. I Sorry. guess they're really, yeah, yes. no longer innovating. So really appreciate all the talks. It was really interesting. A lot of the, I heard a lot about, you know, trying to put people together, take people out of silos at both educational institutions as well as uh, with amongst with getting people together at meetings, but I didn't hear much about collaboration with industry. So I was wondering if people would comment on how to manage the ethics and the finances of direct industry collaboration when you're doing your research. Is this one? Anyway, if you, were, uh, if you were around last week in Chicago, we actually had a whole session on uh, the, the core session we talked about. Uh, research had a whole session on, on industry collaboration and you know I think that uh, frankly industry collaboration although sometimes people get uncomfortable with it because uh, you know resources change hands and people are worried about undue influence I think certainly in our specialty and across medicine it's critical for us to make things real right and uh, we uh, I, I think you just have to be careful that you're um, separating it from your clinical acquisition decisions um, that you're doing uh, value for value in research um, and uh, that you're aligned in what you're trying to accomplish. And I don't know if some of the others have... Uh... Well, I'll just say that you shouldn't forget that when, when I started in radiology, um, working with industry typically meant w working with one of the big imaging companies, right? But now, but now that's changed so much now. There are so many small uh, companies d with innovations and so on. So working with industry is much broader now than it used to be, tremendous opportunities there, and there are good basic principles you can follow that, uh, that are, have been well described that you, that'll keep you out of trouble in that. But that's how we advance our field is, is, is largely in that area. I agree with that. I, maybe what I would add uh, with the uh, existing kind of mature relationships, you know, always a fair market value exchange is a fundamental principle. I think where our challenges are, are in uh, innovations and commercial entities that are developed by our own faculty and uh, earlier stage companies, uh, things like that. And I, I think we do need to develop strategies around that through uh, innovation centers uh, like uh, what Dr. Bennett described and, and other things. Those might be the more challenging areas where there are significant uh, potential um, uh, conflicts of interest. And a question over here. J just a quick comment on Tom Grist's idea of thinking in the shower and some <laughs> dangers in that. Some years ago, we were having a research group meeting, and one of the students presented his results on experiments that I told him I had the idea from thinking in the shower, and he announced to the group that Professor Springer should take more showers. <laughs> <laughs> Food for so thought. So you've got to be careful. <laughs> right here. 
Hey, Andrew Smith from UAB. I'm stuck on the shower thing, too. I can't get over that one. I thought it was a great idea. Uh, one thing my dad told me early on when I started to do innovation and research was to really think about when I'm having the best ideas that I've ever had. And I've been able to track those to some degree. And for me, a lot of times, it's when I ramp my brain up. So for me, it's like an example is I'm on call. I'm super busy. I'm also doing emails, maybe trying to write a grant, multitasking. And then I just shut it all off at the end of call. And I'm driving home, and it's quiet, and it's dark. And that's when those kind of things come. So I found that a lot that I, I can really track when these things happen. And I wondered from some of our highly innovative panelists here if we could kind of extend that question and say, well, when do you have these ideas? I, interestingly enough, I often find myself, I wake up in the morning and they just are there. And, you know, obviously something goes on at night while I'm sleeping, but uh, I see from uh, the time I've been in school all the way through, I often I'll wake up in the morning and, and, and I even got used to putting a, uh, a pad and pencil near my bed so if I woke up and that I could actually jot it down before I forget about it while I'm in the shower. <laughs> well, so you want to be in, uh, I think, um, it was said we need we're inspired by our work by what we do and we're so we're inspired by our patients really by the problems that we face in taking care of our patients that's really important so inspiration is important and and cultivating your own creativity and everybody has a different way of doing that many people find that being a little bit of alone time is helpful um, and uh, I think that working with colleagues is, is very helpful in that area. Working with students, uh, I mean, students are the magic, uh, ma graduate students are the magic ingredient of many, many inventions. So those are some, some things. Uh. I, I do think there is a lot of truth to what you say, however, in, in a contingent of people who, who work really intensely on something and then park it and at a moment later, or sometime shortly afterwards, after that kind of intensity and depletion, then that aha moment comes. Yeah, I think those talks that we have with our colleagues and at this meeting, that is really what gets it going. And then it's when I relax the brain where it maybe takes another leap forward on top of that. Sorry, I'm going to have to cut the question short. A lot of the uh, audience has requested time to take a quick shower before the 315 <laughs> session so that they're ready to go on hepatobiliary and pancreas. But thank you so much for a really an incredible session and well done. For over 20 years, Meetings by Mail has provided the gold standard in enduring material CME. With courses specializing in body imaging, breast imaging, vascular ultrasound, nuclear medicine, and echocardiography, our activities can meet your entire self-assessment CME requirement for maintenance of certification. We collaborate with renowned institutions such as the SCBTMR, Duke Radiology, Penn Radiology, Cleveland Clinic, and many more in order to create high-quality content for the home viewer. Products are available in DVD-ROM format and are streaming online. 400 fully accredited hours of CME are available for your review. Presentation topics are searchable by session, faculty presenter, and keyword search. All video has optimal image clarity with audio cued to every slide. Bookmarking ability allows you to leave the activity and resume seamlessly regardless of device. We have incorporated all CME applications so you can get your certificate immediately after completing an activity. So if you can't make the meeting, bring it to you meetings-by-mail.com. Try Meetings by Mail and make sure you're never too busy to learn.
Trickle back in from outside. I know the caffeine is very important, and hydration is very important here in the Mile High City, but let's get settled in. We're going to go ahead and get started with this next session. It's going to be hepatobiliary and pancreas. My name is Cynthia Santiano. I'm from UC San Diego, and uh, I'll be one of the moderators for this session. Um, so our first talk on our schedule is Innovations in Pancreatic Surgery and Therapy from a Dr. Marco Del Chiaro. If I could welcome up to the stage. We're very excited to hear from our colleagues to learn about how these innovations will impact, how important and differently we need to be describing our findings on imaging. So welcome. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. And uh, really, I appreciate your invitation. And I think for a pancreatic surgeon, actually, there is nothing more important than radiology. And I think it's impossible pancreatic surgery without radiology. So I believe that this is really, for me, a great honor to be here, and uh, I hope there will be a nice discussion after, after the talk. I also wrote here a subtitle, a surgical radiological new interaction, because I think in many aspects of pancreatology, I will touch only one, pancreatic cancer, but the same problem we have for cystic lesion, for example. I think really today we face a new challenge, a new interaction between us, between our two uh, job. So let's say the pancreatic surgery is very much uh, conditioned by some stereotypes that probably are not anymore true, but if we think that just in the 70s, and we are not speaking about 200 years ago, Cry wrote that probably the bypass procedure, so palliative procedure was the standard of care of pancreatic surgery because everyone underwent pancreatic surgery, died of complication, or at least very shortly, for the bad prognosis of pancreatic cancer, and data supported that strongly. And what we are doing now, there is a huge change. Many times we say nothing's changed in pancreas cancer. It's true. Not so much is changed, but compared to this kind of sentence, it's changed a lot. So pancreas cancer, we know, is currently the fourth cause of cancer-related death in the United States and will become the cause number two in a while, in 2030. Now, one of the challenge, I think, of pancreatic cancer, uh, um, I don't know if I can use the, how can I use the pointer? Okay. Yeah, basically only 20% of patients that get diagnosed with pancreatic cancer can be treated surgically at least according to what we know before. So 50% is metastatic disease. Yeah, there are experience here. We'll go through that even in treatment of patients with metastasis, but clearly this is not a surgical indication. 30% are excluded by surgery because locally advanced, but no metastatic. I will focus my attention mostly on this group of patients today because I think in the last decades, we have a big changes for this group of patients. So the problem of pancreas cancer, this is extremely interesting. If you even speak, I mean, your Congress and you listen to your Congress, most of the attention for radiologists, for surgeons, for oncologists, for whoever, is trying to understand the contact with the, of the cancer with the vessel, which vessel, for how long. But my question is, how can it be that something like vascular contact, 30% of the disease, has more importance in our classification than something which is present in 80% of the patient, so systemic disease. So we are dealing with the disease that even when we don't see metastasis, we know it's metastatic because the patient recur, and they all generally don't recur locally. If you look, the local recurrence rate is extremely low, but still we are focusing our attention only on how locally the disease is. That, to me, doesn't make so much sense. And I think the new data are in favor of this opinion. Even if we look at our guideline, we see that the criteria of resection are based mostly on contact with vessel. And I don't know how many of you just put attention on that, that why we don't have any mention on the splenic artery. Why hepatic artery is important and splenic artery is not important. And I think this is mostly the fault of the surgeon. It's our fault that we create some sort of classification which is eminence-based, but it's not evidence-based. Who told that splenic artery infiltration is less important than hepatic artery, or SMA? Do we have data? We have no data. It's just easier to take it out the tumor in the tail of the pancreas, and it's more complicated to take it out the tumor in the head infiltrating the hepatic artery. That's my personal opinion, so even that is not evidence-based, but I have data to show you that are very interesting. So 
On your left, you see a small tumor of the head of the pancreas infiltrating a right hepatic artery from SMA, a accessory right hepatic artery from SMA. This is considered local advance or borderline. It depends by the classification. On the right side of the slides, you see a big tumor. In the tail of the pancreas, infiltrating the splenic artery is considered primary resectable. Is that proof that we are looking biology? Is that proof we are looking for prognosis or we are adjusting our classification what is easier to be done or more complicated to be done? And that's, I think, is an important point that mostly involve uh, not only surgeon, not only radiology, not only oncology, but all the scientific community. We need to try to be objective in our evaluation. Now, we are speaking here about big changes and innovation, and I think the biggest innovation in pancreatic surgery is not what the surgeon did. Actually, this study was conducted by surgeon, but is basically the, uh, the chemotherapy. When I was a young resident, we had no chemotherapy for pancreas cancer. Almost we had no chemotherapy. This study in New England Journal of Medicine changed the history of pancreatic cancer. We understood that adjuvant treatment for pancreas cancer was a standard of care because it was able to improve prognosis of pancreatic cancer. We are speaking of the era of gencidabine, which today probably we consider water because we know it's not so effective, but still with chemotherapy like gencidabine, we should improve in survival in patients under one surgery for pancreatic cancer. Now, in the near future, in the near past, we saw that I mean something better could be done, and especially combining multiple drugs, we obtain better results in survival, and especially even in patients we didn't consider before suitable for surgery, and we introduced the concept of new adjuvant treatment that probably we need to expand to everyone, not only locally advanced, not only in borderline resectable, but still we understood that combining multiple drugs, especially with fulfirinox, we improve survival of our patient, improve significantly survival of our patient. And going to the extreme, this is a paper we published recently with a fellow of mine before I moved in the U.S., showing that we have long-term survival event metastatic disease. I don't want to be misunderstood. I'm not saying we should operate patients with metastatic disease. Actually, this is a contraindication for sure. But there is someone that did. And in the last years, you see more and more cases with better and better survival, even in this super select group of patients, which means that our chemotherapy is becoming much better than what we had in the past. The consequence of this big innovation, the development of better chemotherapy to me, is that we cannot anymore use the same criteria we had before. We had a systemic disease without control. Today we have a systemic disease that we can partially control. Therefore, I think that we need to do a redefinition of the role of current staging system, the redefinition of the resetability criteria, and problem, probably, and this is actually a common problem, how we can assess who deserves surgical exploration after new adjuvant treatment, which I think for both of us remain one of the major challenges in pancreatic surgery and pancreatic treatment. Now, Again, vessel is what generally asked to us be assessed by you in absence of metastasis. But when you check the data objectively, this is a recent study published by the Dutch study group on pancreatic surgery, you see that according with different T stage, which means locally advanced disease or not, there is no difference in survival when the numbers are analyzed only by T stage, which means to me that we have a problem. The problem is the current definition doesn't reflect actually survival, but also a major problem is that whatever is the T stage, we lose 20% of patients in the first year after surgery. So there are patients that independently by the T die early and probably should never be operated even if the operation is easy, and there are patients that live longer even in advanced T stage that probably deserve even a very aggressive surgery. How we can discriminate between these two kind of uh, group of patients remain a mystery for, for all of us, but only working together, we can go there. Now, why then we create this classification based on vessel? Because it's true, in the pre-chemotherapy era, we had different results. This is a paper from the group I worked uh, when I started my career, showing that vein resection go very well, artery resection alone pretty well, arteriovenous resection didn't went very well in terms of survival. Probably not because of the vessel involved, but probably because the tumor were bigger. If you engage simultaneously artery and vein, probably it's bigger, and the dimension of tumor we know is a prognostic factor. 
However, the same study showed that we compared patient underwent vascular resection versus patient underwent a standard procedure, we didn't have a difference in local recurrence, which means the surgery was, yes, able to control the local disease, but not able to control systemic disease. And having not chemotherapy, basically the patient died early, but not for a local problem. How many patients you saw dying for a local recurrence? Honestly, it's more than 10 years that I do only pancreatic surgery. I think I didn't see a single case dying for local recurrence. That's not the problem of pancreatic cancer. Now, this is a recent paper from Karolinska that I published together with one of my PhD students analyzing survival after new adjuvant treatment. And very surprisingly, you can see here that using our classification, borderline and local advanced, we didn't find any significant difference in survival, which means, again, that when you have a therapy able to control the disease distantly, doesn't matter how the tumor looks locally, but matter how biologically the tumor acts. So my idea is biology more than anatomical issue. And still you see that when you compare group of patients underwent surgery for locally advanced or borderline versus the patient that didn't receive surgery, with all the bios of selection, of course, same surgeon, so in one case they decide to proceed, in the other they didn't decide to proceed, but still there is a huge significance in survival. The same data basically published by Harvard group, this is a, the group of Cristina Ferrone, very good friend of mine, showing that doing surgery on those patients with locally advanced disease or borderline after new adjuvant treatment still you have advantages in survival compared to the patient that underwent only chemotherapy. Now, the real paper that make our life more complicated, and probably your life even more complicated than mine, is this paper again from MGH, published by Cristina Ferrone in 2015, in which she told, be careful. Many cases doesn't show any uh, radiological response after new adjuvant treatment, but still, in the majority of those patients, if we go to the OR, we can do a radical operation. So this paper say, you can see just the skeleton of the tumor at the CT scan, doesn't mean there is still a vital, um, uh, vital tumor there. So before to exclude the patient from surgery, be careful. No progression means potentially, and I underline potentially, regression. So this is actually, I think, the biggest challenge we have now, even in defining or describing radiology after new adjuvant treatment. And this is why, if you look the normal, almost never respected guideline or indication for surgery after new adjuvant treatment, you clearly see that when you have basically locally advanced disease, once you have a stable disease, not only regression, you should go for surgical exploration. That happens almost never, but it's probably something we should do. And we should do that because when you go to see the number, and here I have a couple of cases that I wanna share with you. These are two cases in which basically we saw stability of tumor after neoadjuvant treatment. In one case, the artery were engaged, but here just with the vein resection, we did a pancreatectomy, all the artery are skeletonized. This patient has a very high pathological response and very minimal residual tumor. This patient that was engaged in truncus, SMA, and everything was possible to take it out only with the distal, with all margin negatives. And the reason is that radiology, we cannot expect by radiology to discriminate vital or not vital tumor, but in pathology, actually, in a large significant group of patients, around 70%, you still have some pathological response, even if you don't see anything radiologically. So that's a crucial point, and very difficult point, because how can we discriminate between those patients? So when we speak about that, surgeon needs something else from you need to understand if technically it's feasible or not, this kind of operation. And that is extremely important. So describing there is a vein infiltration, and for vein we are not speaking anymore about the bedding. We know that it's worth to do surgery. That's, I mean, is very well standardized in every kind of guideline. We need to know how can we rebuild the vein. So it's not enough anymore to say there is a vein infiltration, so there is no surgery, but actually there could be, there should be surgery. So we need to understand not only the length of infiltration, but also if I have space proximally or distally to reconstruct the continuity. Here you see an end-to-end -end anastomosis of the portal vein with the SMV in the root of mesentery after a, a Whipple procedure. This is also another interesting fact what, hap what, what happens in the root of mesentery? Can I save all the branches of the vein? Another very important information. Yes, you can. You have more or less one centimeter, which is what you see here in this 
end-to-end -end anastomosis between the SMV in the root of mesentery and the confluence of the splenic and the portal vein. But this information become today, after new adjuvant treatment and today in which we can afford even more complex operation, essential to be known in our multidisciplinary conference and discussion. This is another case in the tumor was pretty small, but in this case was on the portal vein, and you see here the portal vein anastomosis with the confluence of the splenic and the SMV. This is the case you saw before. This tumor was born very close to the accessory, well, sorry, from the right hepatic artery from SMA. You see here the results of the dissection of the lymph nodes. This is the portal vein. This is the splenic artery rotated, and which we rebuilt, I mean, the right hepatic artery. Even there, important, do I have a takeoff space to make my anastomosis? Is it the splenic artery free to be rotated and to be used to reconstruct the vessel? And all information that in the on new adjuvant treatment and better results of this operation, the surgeon needs to know by the radiologist. This is a case of a patient with a tumor infiltrating the SMA, stable after fulfirinox. You are better than me in assessing how much stable it is. Stable, maybe a little bit of regression but still contact with the SMA. What I need to know here, I need to know if I have a free margin of the SMA to rebuild the vessel after the resection. And then I need to check if radiology is accurate. So you see here, there is the aorta, there is the origin of the SMA of the, from the aorta, and also the right hepatic artery from the aorta. Check it, clean from tumor. You check in the root of mesenteries, SMA is free. Here you see the tumor just attached to the SMA then you do a cross clamping of the SMA and end-to-end -end anastomosis. You can see here the anastomosis. That's possible only because you give us the information to plan an operation, to make the anastomosis short, to don't wait time, to have a short time of ischemia of the bowel. Otherwise, it would be impossible for us to plan this kind of surgery. And this is the CT scan done after surgery showing the reconstruction. This is another case, very rare, but in which you have a tumor in the body of the pancreas infiltrating the truncus. Very important is not only to know that the truncus is infiltrated. The patient received new adjuvant treatment, remains stable. We can think about surgery, so do I need to reconstruct the truncus or can I do surgery without reconstruction, which means I need to know if the gastrododinal artery is free. And of course, even if you don't see free, there is a possibility it's free because maybe it's just a fibrosis and not any more tumor, but at least to know before that it's free make you very relaxed and knowing that you can proceed with the operation. So the gastrododinal, very important to know, and here you see basically the common hepatic ligated, the gastrododinal ear, the uh, proper hepatic artery, and the truncus, which is resected on the aorta. So basically, the pa in this case, the operation was planned very easily before uh, surgery thanks to a good assessment by radiologist. This is a little bit more complicated case in which we had the multiple vessel infiltration. You see here the hepatic artery is already rebuilt with the end-to-end -end anastomosis, but we know before that was possible here the tumor is still attached to the vein, and here you see the final results with the end-to-end -end anastomosis of the SMV with the portal vein. This is an even more complicated case, simultaneous engagement of SMA and SMV. Again, after fulfilling ox, but what is important, we know that we have free margin that can be used to reconstruct the vessel. And here you see still the specimen attached to the SMB SMA in the root, and here you see the final results. It's basically an autobowel transplantation. All the bowel is mobilized, pull it up, and then you do an end-to-end -end anastomosis between the SMA uh, uh, terminally, uh, sorry, uh, proximally and distally, and the same with SMB with the portal vein. I want to also show you something more shocking. Sometimes you see really very bad disease coming everywhere. All the vessels are infiltrated to the aorta. This is a recent case actually we did. You see the results. We didn't reset any vessel. Well, yes, a small piece of the portal vein here with a patch. All the artery was possible to clean after fulfilling ox. But this was a patient that according with our classification is called unresectable. And actually was resected, no leaving tissue there as you can see. So once you call something unresectable as also legal impact, we need to be, all of us, agreeing on trying to give a chance that can be that this tissue is just that tissue. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes there is still tumor and then you cannot do anything. But I think this is a very important concept that both of us, we should try to use the same language and have an agreement on the terminology we use in this new era of uh, um, new adjuvant treatment. Now, 
are safe this operation. In the past, we told the Fortner did in the 70s, and everyone died, 16% mortality. Yeah, but in the same period of time, Norma Whipple had 16% of mortality. Only later, with the centralization, the improvement of anesthesiological technique, you see that the mortality was reduced. So it's true that it was very dangerous at that time, but maybe different today. This is vein resection. Our series from Karolinska, when I was working there, 320, uh, 12, sorry, vein resection. You see morbidity and mortality very similar to other kind of pancreatectomy. And this is the results of our arterial resection with around 3% of mortality. Yeah, maybe a little bit higher than the normal pancreatectomy, but still in the range considered the standard of care for pancreatic surgery. Now, you can say, okay, but some series have different results. This is experience of Mayo Clinic, probably, in my knowledge, the largest existing today, in the US, at least in arterial resection, probably Heidelberg in Germany has a higher uh, experience in that. And the funny things, I compared the results of the Mayo Clinic with our from Karolinska, and you see very different mortality. There could be some technical reason. In US, it's very difficult to do total pancreatectomy. We generally use a total pancreatectomy to avoid leakage in arterial resection. And also the use of radiation therapy that, in my opinion, can be very dangerous in arterial resection. And that was, in majority of cases, done by Mayo Clinic. But mostly, I think, to be very honest, the Mayo Clinic treated much more aggressive, aggressively very more locally advanced cases. So I think they're really a standard indication. Uh, and uh, the first comment generally of people say, but this is an acceptable mortality. I am not sure even this 9% is unacceptable because when you look at the results, and you will see in a while, you will see the survival that they had in these cases. And also there is another thing that I would like to underline, stating that vein resection, everyone demonstrates the same morbidity or mortality. But in arterial resection, it's true that there are very debatable data. But when we look data from transplant, in which you do a double vessel, at least, anastomosis, the results are better. So it means that maybe surgical oncologists need to improve their technique for vascular resection. That doesn't mean that they are not possible to be done. We need probably to increase our skills in doing this kind of procedure, which doesn't mean that there is not an oncological indication. This is the results of vein resection. Basically, it's clearly known today that there is no difference compared to the normal Whipple. And this is our even our results after, after um, our analysis of the experience of Karolinska showing that by stage, even in vein resection, we have no differences. But very intriguing is the last year publication arterial resection. You see here, I was happy and proud that Karolinska, we had the 20% survival of patients that went arterial resection after five years, but Mayo Clinic, remember we discussed before about mortality, 40% five-year survival arterial resection after new adjuvant treatment, 40%. That's versus zero when I was a young resident. And that's for sure a merit of Mayo Clinic, but it's also a mostly merit of the fact that today we have multimodal approach, we have better chemotherapy, and those results can only be better in the future. So we need to be ready to stage and to treat this patient because the results will be better and better. Now, here again, the challenge is how we select patient. We know that most of the patient after neoadjuvant treatment show no regression of disease, even if pathologically there is a regression of disease. And that's open a huge problem because this is, I made some calculation myself, probably are not completely exact, but this is the number of patients got pancreatic cancer in the US from 2001 to 2015. So if we consider that 30% of them are locally advanced, we are speaking about 76,000 people. And if we consider that after neoadjuvant treatment, 52,000 as probably a stable disease, of those patients, 40,000 as a pathological response. But if we still say the tumor is stable, these 40,000 patients will never get the proper treatment that they deserve. So terminology today is crucial. Now, there could be some hundreds of patient errors because of course I matched together percentage coming from different paper. I don't wanna say this is a real number, but it's very realistic number. Look in the publication we have today. So my dream for the future is we stop to discuss about anatomy. Anatomy is something surgical and surgeon tend always to keep stuff for themselves, and I hope we will define risicability of pancreas cancer based on biology. In my view, this is a proposal, but I mean, of course, this did need to be changed, but just to let you understand which is my view, is that a patient that has a 
less than 12 months survival expectancy should never be operated, even if it's easy to be operated. That should be the real unresectable. When you go from one to two years, maybe it's a borderline resectable. We need to balance the price of the operation with the patient condition, normal expectancy of life based on another aspect, and when it's more than two years, probably we need to be aggressive. And then even this kind of operation, maybe even paying a little bit higher mortality, probably are deserved because you attend a, large, a, a longer survival. Do we have something can help us to make this discrimination? Actually not. I think we need to investigate on that. CA99 then shows some good uh, attitude as a marker, but there are limitations. 20% of population cannot express CA99. And also, this is again a study we published in Anso Surgery from Karoliska showing that for every value of CA99, still surgery is superior to palliation in this group of patients. So yes, it is important. Mayo uh, MD Anderson published, uh, recently published another paper saying the same, but they told we cannot exclude surgery for high level of CA99 because we have no proof enough that this is so accurate. So probably will be multiple factor analysis, core analysis in trying to classify patient for biology and prognosis more than for anatomical aspects. So in conclusion, pancreas cancer remains one of the most aggressive tumor. Today we have a much better systemic control of the disease and actually this is mostly related to better chemotherapy. Having better control systemically of the disease means that probably our indication for surgery need to be changed. Radiologists are essential in the technical planning of the operation. But I think also that we cannot, we need to change and we need to agree on terminology. After new adjuvant, we cannot speak anymore about tumor. Sometimes you see stable tumor, you don't find tumor in pathology. We need to call tissue. We need to call whatever you want. You are more adequate than me to define that, but I think we need to discuss together, to sit together, and to make some evaluation. How can we proceed with the next terminology? And I think also that no one theoretically should be excluded. Of course, adjusting for risk of the patient, age, comorbidity, but no one should be excluded by a surgical exploration with the intent of resection just based on the stability of disease. And I believe that in this role to try to include as much more patient as possible for a potentially curable plan, you play much bigger role than surgeon because uh, you are the one that basically state what happens after this treatment. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Del Chiaro. Um, so important, once again, a reminder how that we as radiologists need to evolve our language and content of our reports to reflect innovations in therapy. Next up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jane Wang to the stage. She'll be giving us an update on imaging and management of neuroendocrine tumors. And once again, we'll have a time for question at the end of the session. Thank you, Cynthia. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to first uh, thank the organizing committee for the invitation to speak here. So in the next 15 minutes, I want to review with you some of the key um, concepts and updates in imaging and management of neuroendocrine tumor. And I want to first um, highlight some of the key considerations of neuroendocrine tumor imaging using CT and MRI, followed by a discussion on functional imaging using PET, and especially with respect to dotatate PET, which has really changed the clinical practice of neuroendocrine tumor diagnosis as well as therapy. So as we know, neuroendocrine tumor is a heterogeneous group of tumor, and the common sites include uh, include GI tract and the pancreas, and up to about 25% of those are associated with genetic syndrome. And imaging really is essential for detection, characterization, and, and um, uh, therapy monitoring as well. CT and MRI are still the most commonly used modality in your endocrine tumor imaging, and an appropriately timed multiphase CT is essential for detection. And uh, Especially a pancreatic parenchymal phase uh, CT is really critical as it maximizes contrast between tumor and normal pancreas um, and increase the detection of hypervascular liver metastasis. 
So here's an example of how scan delay can affect the sensitivity of tumor detection. On your left, you see is a pancreatic parenchymal phase obtained around 45 seconds following uh, contrast administration, and you see this hypervascular tumor. Uh, you see that because of the contrast between the tumor and a normal pancreas and this tumor is poorly seen on the portal venous phase. So what about the CT sensitivity? Uh, it ranges between 83 to 88% in the pancreatic parenchymal phase and a lower at 11 to 76% for the portal venous phase. In addition to appropriately timed multiphase CT, dual energy CT can also increase the conspicuity of hypervascular tumor. And here's an example where they're in this patient with a large burden of liver, liver metastases, you can clearly see these liver tumors much better, much higher conspicuity on the IDA map from dual energy CT because this really accentuates any tissue that contain iodinated contrast, and that's in con contrast to the conventional CT where the tumors are much uh, less conspicuous. And indeed, in this study, looking at insulinoma, um, there is a higher sensitivity of pre-op diagnosis using dual energy CT, about 96% compared to conventional CT at 69%. So if um, your practice has CT scanners that has dual energy capability, I really encourage you to use that for many of these indications, including your endocrine tumor imaging. MRI is a problem-solving tool because of its multi-parametric nature. It can improve the visualization of tumors that are called on CT with the sensitivity and specificity as shown here. And I always tell my uh, uh, residents, the fellows, to really interrogate the pancreas on the T1 pre-contrast image with fast saturation as it can increase tumor conspicuity. As in this case, you can see the small tumor in the pancreat pancreatic head, and you can see that because of the natural contrast between the hypo-intense small tumor and the hyper-intense uh, pancreas parenchyma, and here you can see that this is poorly seen despite the effort of doing these multi-phase uh, imaging post-contrast. It turns out the neuroendocrine tumor is pretty cellular, so diffusion-weighted imaging is quite helpful in improving tumor conspicuity, as shown here. There's a small tumor in the pancreatic body, poorly seen on the T1 post-contrast images, uh, better seen on the T1 pre-contrast with fast saturation, and really seen conspicuously on the diffusion-weighted images. And in this study, looking at pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor using a different uh, data sets, imaging data sets, it's been shown that the fused diffusion uh, DWI image and the T2 image really allow highest rate of tumor detection. Uh, additionally, DWI improves the liver METS detection, and here's an example. We see this dominant tumor in the uh, caudate of the liver, poorly seen on the post-contrast, and really a light bulb on the diffusion-weighted imaging. And in addition, there are these small satellite lesions that are best seen on the DWI uh, compared to the other two uh, sequences. And in this study, um, specifically looking at neuroendocrine tumor liver METS detection, um, DWI really outperformed both T2-weighted images and dynamic post-contrast images for both observers. I just want to highlight the utility of hepatobiliary contrasts in, um, in the context of pancreatic or in the context of neuroendocrine tumor liver METS detection. So here's an example. This uh, was in the hepatobiliary phase following godositate enhanced MRI. You can clearly see this uh, uh, metastasis that is poorly seen on the dynamic post-contrast imaging using extracellular contrast. And in this study that has 123 patients, the, they have both the neuroendocrine and colorectal liver METS they underwent both godositate and non-hepatospecific MRI, and godositate disodium MRI found new lesions, as well as excluding lesions in about 20% of patients. So uh, for MRI, to really optimize MRI detection of neuroendocrine tumor, we would include T2-weighted imaging, diffusion-weighted imaging, as well as dynamic pre- and post-contrast uh, imaging following godositate uh, uh, disodium. 
So now let's shift gear a little bit and talk about functional imaging with dotatate PET. And as we know that dotatate binds to somatostatin receptor, which is commonly expressed in your endocrine tumor. Uh, historically, the nuclear medicine approach to imaging your endocrine tumor is really with the NDM111 labeled altreotide or altria scan. But in comparison, dotatate PET is much faster than the altria scan. Imaging can be acquired to following one hour following tracer injection compared to 24 hours in the case of altria scan. And the gallium 68 dotatate is highly sensitive and specific for detection of neuroendocrine tumor with a sensitivity and specificity in the mid 90s in this meta analysis that includes over 2,100 patients. And importantly, it is really helpful in selecting patients for peptide receptor radionuclide therapy, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So I just want to show you a few examples of the increased sensitivity with Dota tape head. And here, this patient has the small lytic bony mets that we can see on CT. It's confirmed on the Dota head. Tate PET CT, and there's also a little, oh, there's also a, a, another met in the sacrum which was occult on CT. A different example of a patient with small bowel neuroendocrine tumor with peritoneal disease, and clearly here you see the peritoneal deposits along the liver surface and anterior peritoneum. Very, very difficult to make that diagnosis using um, uh, CT imaging. A different case of a neuroendocrine tumor with a large liver met, clearly seen on the Dota tape head, and they are occult on both dynamic CT and MRI uh, post-contrast images. So we already mentioned that the um, hepatobiliary phase um, MRI can increase the conspicuity of liver mets. And at our institution, in our practice for neuroendocrine tumor, we uh, commonly use the integrated PET MRI um, to evaluate these. And uh, for the MRI part, we use the Godosite disodium to improve the liver meds detection. And here's an example where there's this tiny lesion in the posterior um, uh, lobe of the liver that's confirmed on the PET, and then there's another tiny metastasis more anteriorly, and in retrospect, it was also present on the uh, hepatobiliary phase MRI. And it really, the combination of these images increase the sensitivity, really increase our confidence in diagnosing small liver metastasis for neuroendocrine tumor. We already alluded to that the Dodate head is highly sensitive in comparison to Altria scan. And here's just an example where the Altria scan did not show any avid foci, where the Dodate head shows pretty significant disease burden in both the liver as well as the lymph nodes. So what about the comparison with FDG PET? So here's this example, patient uh, with neuroendocrine tumor has pretty extensive liver mets on CT. These are actually non-avid on the Dota Tay PET, but were avid on the FDG. And it's important uh, to know that uh, Dota Tay PET detects well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor because of these usually contain higher expression level of somatostatin receptor, where the FDG PET detects poorly differentiated tumor with low expression, and these are, in fact, more FDG avid as in many aggressive cancers. Here's a different example. This patient also um, had nodal metastasis um, on both sides in the retroperitoneum, and you can see that the Dodate PET shows an avid lesion on the left side, nodal METs, where the FDG PET shows avid disease on the right side. So it really shows that this imaging um, helps us understand the, the uh, tumor heterogeneity even within a given patient. And um, of course, not all avid sites are disease. It does have physiologic uptake, including the thymus, as shown here, as well as the pancreatic head, which is um, an important pitfall to recognize as this could mimic um, neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas. And finally, you can have uptake in adrenal adenomas. 
So I want to spend the last few minutes just talking about strategies of peptide receptor radionucleotide in the context of um, gal uh, rather um, lutetium-177 for advanced uh, neuroendocrine tumor. So for neuroendocrine tumor that express somatostatin receptor, we can have the targeting peptide, in this case the somatostatin analog, linked to a radioactive tag, in this case the lutetium-177. And when these are taken up to the cells, it creates cell death. So this is a pivotal study that was uh, uh, publishing New England Journal of Medicine back in 2017. This is the first phase three multicenter um, randomized trial of lutetium dotatate in neuroendocrine tumor in comparison to high dose of triotite in patients with um, uh, low grade metastatic or uh, locally advanced neuroendocrine tumor who have progressed on standard therapy. And what we can see here is there's a striking difference in progression-free progression survival um, between patients who were treated with the one, uh, lutetium-177 dotatate compared to the control, which in this case were actually treated with high dose um, uh, triotide, and there's a reduction of approximately 80% in those that were treated with dotatate. And at the time of the publication, uh, the interim analysis also showed a significant benefit in um, overall survival with a reduction of approximately 40% in over, uh, risk of uh, progression, or rather uh, improvement in uh, overall survival in patients treated with dotatate. And similarly, there's a favorable response um, in, uh, by the objective tumor response criteria. So because of that, the FDA approved a lutetium-177 dotatate for treatment of neuroendocrine tumor uh, back in 2018. And that there are uh, different patient selection criteria that, um, uh, that are needed. And uh, these include tumor grade, the SSTR density, operability, distribution of disease as listed here, but it's important to know that the SSTR density, the distribution disease, these are ones that are really determined or readily determined by imaging using gallium-60 a um, dotatate PET and making this truly a theranostic agent where it can uh, both enable diagnosis, selection of patients for therapy as well as uh, treatment. And here's just in a quick example of a patient with extensive liver metastasis burden from neuroendocrine tumor pre-treatment with a lutetium-177 dotatate and a following treatment, there's near complete resolution of liver metastasis. So you can see that the, uh, this really has opened new avenues for treatment in advanced neuroendocrine tumor with the uh, lutetium dotatate. And um, there are still many um, future research direction as well as how we can really further optimize this um, treatment for clinical care. And this uh, was a nice review published in 2018 looking at these some of these future directions um, that includes response assessment, how do we best optimize the number of therapy cycles, how one sequence and combine with different treatment, whether how it should be delivered uh, via IA or intravenous route, and finally, um, whether it should use uh, the Itrim um, 90 versus the Lutetium 177, whether it should be alpha versus beta emitters. So in conclusion, we talked about these um, new updates in neuroendocrine imaging and management. And a few take home message, one is that optimized CT and MRI imaging protocols are really essential for neuroendocrine tumor detection and staging, and that includes appropriately timed contrast phases. And a dual energy CT and multiparametric MRI can really improve the diagnostic accuracy. And uh, also important to note that Dota Tape PET has really quite revolutionized the way we image and treat um, neuroendocrine tumor, can improve the diagnostic capability, and in conjunction with the one, uh, lutetium 177 Dota Tate, um, really enables theranostic. So, with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. That was a phenomenal talk. <clears throat> and next talk, I'd like to um, introduce Dr. Ehab Kamel. 
Um, he's going to talk about pancreatic cysts, guidelines on management of incidentally detected pancreatic cysts, the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the invitation, uh, particularly to discuss this important topic with a lot of new information uh, becoming available. Uh, uh, this is my disclosure. Uh, as you know, you're seeing a lot more cysts in your practice in uh, probably daily, uh, and the question is what to do with them. Many of these cysts range from benign to locally aggressive or known malignant potential to invasive tumors, and therefore management is uh, uh, widely variable from f no further action to additional follow-up or additional intervention and uh, certainly surgery as well. Unfortunately, we know that overall preoperative diagnostic accuracy is less than 70%. So we're not really good in sending these patients to uh, surgery. Now, just a quick uh, algorithmic approach to the differential diagnosis of cystic pancreatic lesions. Uh, certainly imaging is very important in the differential diagnosis. And we look for ductal communication, best seen on MRI. If you see ductal communication, history becomes important. If there is history of pancreatitis, it's a pseudocyst for the most part. No history of pancreatitis, most likely IPMN. Now, if there is no ductal communication, we look for other morphological features, whether it's a unilocular cyst, again, no history of pancreatitis, uh, if there is history of pancreatitis, it's a pseudocyst. If no history of pancreatitis, we look for another feature, whether there is rim enhancement or not. If there is a rim enhancement, you're dealing with a cystic islet cell tumor. If there is no rim enhancement, it's a mucinous cystic neoplasm. It could certainly be a mucinous cystic neoplasm that is a macrocystic. If it's microcystic, it's a serous cystic neoplasm. Of course, in a young patient, young female with cystic and solid component, think of SPEN. Okay, so this is an overview of pathologic features, MRI features, demographics as well, and looking at the typical features, which I'm not going to get into, but fluid characteristics can be helpful as well, whether it's high amylase suggesting the presence of acute pancreatitis, no mucin, low viscosity, low CA, and low amylase would favor a serous cyst, the presence of mucin, high viscosity, high high CA and low amylase would favor either a mucinous cystic neoplasm or IPMN. Okay. So the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think the good is the serous cyst. The bad is going to be some mucin-containing cyst. The ugly hopefully wouldn't kill the patient, but maybe hemorrhagic, maybe with layering, maybe with debris is the pseudocyst. So here is the clinical conundrum. Most common cystic pancreatic lesions, some of them may have atypical features. Less common cystic lesions of the pancreas may be difficult to diagnose, and I'll show you some examples. Many resected lesions are benign, unfortunately, and beware of the peripancreatic lesions that can often be confused as pancreatic lesions. This is more of a straightforward diagnosis by MRI, can be a little bit of a challenge on CT, low attenuation lesion on, um, in, in the pancreas, easy diagnosis in and out of phase with uh, loss of signal in the opposed phase. This is focal fat. This one is a little bit more challenging, and we had an excellent discussion about the role of unenhanced T1. This is a case where it was suspected to be main duct IPMN in the tail of the pancreas, but when you look more carefully, there's pancreatic adenocarcinoma here, resulting in dilatation of the distal uh, portion of the pancreatic duct. So be very careful when you see focally dilated pancreatic duct. This is an 83-year-old uh, male with a question of pancreatic cyst by CT, 
T2 bright, uh, no enhancement, no septations, no mural nodules, no dilation of the pancreatic duct. This was sent for surgery, and this was a bronchogenic cyst. It doesn't matter how good you are, you're going to encounter some of these lesions. Here's another example, incidental finding of a pancreatic cyst, and went, uh, a patient underwent workup for cough. This is an exophytic lesion in the tail of the pancreas, slightly bright on T2, no suppression on out of phase, no internal enhancement, again, no septations, no dilation pancreatic duct. Unfortunately, this was a lymphoepithelial cyst. So it can be very challenging when you're dealing with pancreatic slash peripancreatic lesions. Here's another example, patient with nausea and dyspnea. So they're symptomatic. Uh, this is a T2 bright lesion, also T1 bright, so suggesting maybe hemorrhage or protein with some layering. Again, no ductal communication, no internal enhancement, and uh, there's no mural nodules and no dilated pancreatic duct. This was pathologically a foregut cyst. This is a lesion that we had a while back, uh, and uh, we thought we had established communication with the main pancreatic duct. This was, uh, we thought, uh, dealing with an IPMN with ductal communication, only with better sequence development and more 3D acquisitions. It turned out that that ductal communication is actually with the main, with the common duct, with the, not with the pancreatic duct. So what we've been calling all along IPMN turned out to be a type 2 colodocal cyst. We just never could see the communication well, but now we can. So, What's the value of a multidisciplinary clinic? And as you know, most of the cysts that we see fall in one of these two categories. Either no or low malignant potential, such as pseudocyst or serous cyst, or the high malignant potential, the mucin component, including the IPMNs and the mucinous cystic neoplasm. Now, in a multidisciplinary clinic, we don't see a lot of pseudocysts because they're more straightforward. So we tend to try to distinguish between serous and mucin and a cystic neoplasm, and often send these patients to EUS. And unfortunately, EUS works in about 50% of the time. And when it works, it can help you distinguish between mucinous cystic neoplasm, but looking at these fluid biomarkers and also genetic mutations, which I'll describe. But oftentimes, the results of the sample is inadequate. This is one example where it helped distinguishing between mucus plugs and mucinous secretions and a mural nodule. But oftentimes, the sample is inadequate. A lot of interest in developing these molecular biomarkers, and they improve sensitivity and specificity for detecting mucinous neoplasm, and can certainly help in reducing the number of unnecessary operations. So we're going to be hearing more about this in the near future. This is a study looking at 225 referrals to a single institution and these lesions were put in five categories, no, low, intermediate, high risk, and clear malignancy with four different management approaches, including surveillance, surgical resection, further evaluation, and discharge. And I want to highlight here the fact that in about a third of these patients, we changed the management completely, put the patient in a different category. What was disappointing is that even in a multidisciplinary clinic, eight patients who went to surgery were incorrectly classified. So this is just the nature of the difficulty, the challenges that we deal with. Okay, so what are the current guidelines? When you see that many guidelines, you know that we really don't know the right answer. And that's part of, this, that's part of the challenge. Starting with the 2006 Tanaka criteria that was modified in 2012, also in 2010, part of the incidental Loma uh, criteria we'll touch upon uh, briefly. This was largely replaced recently by the American College of Radiology white paper that I'm going to uh, discuss as well. Uh, to add more complexity, in 2015, the American Gastroenterology Association came up with their own criteria. So basically, the uh, incidentaloma criteria looked at various lesion sizes, and a lesion less than two centimeter was followed up once uh, for one year and then stopped if it was stable. 
and if it is larger from two to three centimeter, you stop after two years. So gastroenterologists were a little concerned about that because certainly it wasn't long-term enough to determine that leash lesions would remain stable and don't turn into a malignant adenocarcinoma. The Tanaka criteria was revised from 2006 back in 2012 and unfortunately went to another extreme where they identified suspicious features, but regardless of the size of the lesion, whether it's less than one centimeter or one to two centimeter or two to three centimeter, there was no end to follow up. If it's less than one centimeter, you get CTMR in two to three years, but they didn't specify when to stop. So it was very, very over utilization of imaging and EUS in many of these pancreatic uh, uh, patients with pancreatic cysts. Now, the 2015 American, uh, American Gastroenterology Association guidelines triggered some additional concerns because the suggestion was, regardless of the size, to stop surveillance at five years at five years. So even though this was okay with the radiologists, a lot of gastroenterologists were concerned because of the potential risk of developing adenocarcinoma in patients with pancreatic cysts. The concerns were that if the cyst is less than three centimeter without a solid component or a dilated pancreatic duct, that the surveillance is for five years, and if there's no change, you stop. So it argued against continued surveillance if there's no change for five years. The issues were that also there were a suggestion to, uh, against routine surveillance of cysts, without high-grade dysplasia or malignancy at resection. Then we'll demonstrate that there is actually a risk of developing adenocarcinoma in such cases. Ironically, very close uh, within a few months of uh, the, these guidelines, two landmark papers in radiology by uh, Victoria Cherniak. The first one looked at the increase, reported increased mortality for patients younger than 65 with overall increased risk of pancreatic adenocarcinoma. Also, Olga Brook reported that in spite of initial stability of cystic lesions at baseline, there were some of these cysts that grew over time beyond the one year period. So this triggered another um, white paper that is generated by the American College of Radiology, led by Alec Megabo and several uh, authors in this room today, uh, looking at what to do with these incidental lesions. And we took into consideration age, symptoms, size, imaging features, size of the pancreatic duct, growth, and multiplicity as well. We defined growth depending on different cyst size. We defined what would be considered concerning for a main duct. We defined the concerning features such as a mural nodule, wall thickening, dilated main duct, and these should trigger EUS. And the decision to stop follow-up was dependent on stability, but also comorbidities as well as patient's preference we recommended or suggested actually surgical consult for serous cyst above six centimeter. This is the suggested algorithm. These are only for adults and asymptomatic. If at any points there are symptoms, we should get surgical consult. All cysts are considered mucinous unless proven otherwise. Cyst side direct size directs the follow-up for the intervention. And at any time, if there are new features, we should get EUS. Cyst growth uh, should consider more frequent follow-up and EUS. What was highlighted but not in a table in the text, and I would urge you to look at it, is what to do with the white dot. So something that's T2 bright, less than five millimeters, we suggested one follow-up in two years, then stop. In fact, we put in this white paper that some may not even report it in patients 75 to 80 years of age. This is an example of the algorithm, and I'm not gonna go through it, but in general, we went to a 10-year follow-up period depending on age at presentation, features at presentation, the frequency, and the follow-up 
is for about 10 years for patients less than 80. This is just an algorithmic approach with various cyst size and how to follow them up, but the average was about 10 years. This is for larger type cysts. Again, stop follow up after 10 years. Now for patients 80 and older, the follow up is for five years or if the patient is no longer a surgical candidate. So more recently, this is a recently uh, published article looking at the changes that happen for these cysts over an extended period of time. We followed over 600 cysts over a 50 month period and we stratify them in two or more than two lesions. And we followed these cysts over an extended period of time and watched the changes based on the ACR stratification and guidelines. The septations were present in about a quarter of these lesions. Mural nodules were fairly there, rightly, because if we see a mural nodule, we don't follow it up, we intervene. This is a summary of all the changes that occur. Most of the cysts remain stable. The change, the increase in size is in about the third of these lesions, usually the ones um, above five millimeters, five millimeters and above. What we reported here is that lesions that are less than five millimeters, the growth uh, was about 13% over extended period of time. What is important uh, is to realize that among all cysts less than five millimeters at baseline, 100% of these cysts were stable at three years and less than 6% increase in five years. So you can safely follow these lesions for um, three to five year period once and then you stop. Another recent change is this has just been released, the appropriateness criteria. What is pertinent to this talk is how to follow up these cysts. We followed the same concept of the white paper as far as the frequency, as far as the need for follow-up, the average follow-up. Again, we reported that based on limited experience, cysts that less than five millimeter may require one additional follow-up, whether it's two, three, or five years, but certainly one follow-up is adequate and then you can stop. So this is a quick overview of the MR imaging of the cysts. Definitely MR is an excellent modality for the detection and characterization. You need to recognize the specific features of each lesion. We know that the multidisciplinary approach is very useful and it often changes management. The role of molecular biomarkers is evolving and the indication and frequency of follow-up of small lesions remain controversial, but less than five millimeter, you can safely follow these up once, maybe two, three to five years, and then stop. The white paper and the ACR guidelines are available, and I urge you to look at them, and we'll be happy to answer any questions in the discussion later on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. And now we're going to shift to liver imaging. We have Dr. Takeshi Yoko, who's going to speak on abbreviated MR uh, protocols for HCC screening, uh, hepatobiliary versus extracellular agents. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the organizer for inviting me. Um, I took the liberty of changing the, uh, the title a little bit. So I'm going to talk about extracellular or hepatobiliary, or maybe neither. Um, uh, again, I'm uh, from UT Southwestern, and I forgot to uh, enter uh, my disclosure uh, slide because I don't have any relevant disclosures. So uh, let's start by, uh, by discussing uh, why do we even bother screening for HCC. Over 90% of HCCs that occur in the United States develop in, uh, in patients with cirrhosis. And uh, in, in patients with a compensated uh, cirrhosis, HCC is actually the leading cause. Uh, if HCC is discovered at late stage, it's almost uniformly uh, fatal. But if HCC is detected at an early stage, uh, the patient may receive a curative therapy with a survival benefit. So that's the, re that's the reason why practice guidelines recommend HCC screening uh, in at-risk patients, including cirrhosis. And, uh, and the recommended modality is ultrasound uh, every six months without, without AFP. 
But ultrasound quality can be unreliable in cirrhosis. For example, um, we did a uh, uh, study uh, in a few, a few years ago at the, our institution. We took an, uh, nine, over 900 patients who were receiving uh, screening ultrasound um, for, for cirrhosis, and we uh, characterized the, um, the uh, image quality uh, as adequate uh, or likely inadequate or definitely in inadequate. So we found that the 20% uh, of these screening exams were actually uh, likely or uh, definitely inadequate. And the whole point of doing the ultrasound is to exclude ACC, right? So if one in five of ultrasound, we are unable to achieve that objective, we have a problem. Um, Ultrasound has, actually has low sensitivity in cirrhosis. So the, the limited quality uh, likely uh, translates to a low sensitivity. And uh, uh, several investigators has uh, looked at, um, did a meta-analysis uh, to look at the sensitivity for early stage uh, in the ACC detection. And here's is one, um, uh, one study done by, um, by our uh, research collaborator. And um, ultrasound alone had a overall sensitivity of only 63%. Uh, and even if you add AFP to it, uh, there was only a marginal uh, uh, improvement in, in uh, sensitivity. Other uh, meta-analysis uh, actually showed that the ultrasound has an even lower sensitivity um, uh, among cirrhosis. So again, that highlights the, uh, the problem of a ultrasound-based screening. Um, MRI, uh, on the other hand, uh, is believed to have higher sensitivity in cirrhosis. And again, uh, multiple investigators have, have done uh, several meta-analysis uh, that's been published, and I'm just picking one of them. So uh, this meta-analysis showed that the sensitivity of MRI, if uh, uh, the extracellular agent was used, was about 80%. If a uh, hepatobiliary uh, agent was used, the sensitivity uh, may have been a little bit higher, 85%. So uh, MRI appears to have a higher sensitivity for, uh, for early stage ACCs than ultrasound, but, but these were evaluated in, in, in different cohorts. So, uh, so you might ask, is there any data that compared ultrasound and, and MRI head to head? And indeed, there is. And uh, this was the uh, seminal paper that was uh, published in 2017 by a Korean group. Um, what they did was a, a prospective paired screening study. Uh, they called a Prius study. They took for, uh, over 400 cirrhosis patients at high risk of HCC, and they subjected the, these patients with ultrasound and uh, hepatobiliary agent MRI every six months. And they found that the sensitivity of ultrasound is quite low sensitivity of uh, MRI is quite high, and that, the difference was statistically significant. And they also looked at the differences in, in false positives, and MRI was again uh, uh, superior to ultrasound. So, so this serves as a scientific uh, su uh, support for, uh, for using MRI uh, in HCC screening. The problem with MRI um, is that it's more expensive than ultrasound. Um, and several cost-effectiveness uh, analyses have been performed com uh, com um, that looked at MRI as a screening modality uh, in, in cirrhosis, and this is the first one that was being published in 2008. So they compared uh, no surveillance to annual MRI versus semi-annual ultrasound. Uh, this is, so this is now what's, what's being recommended. So um, the, uh, I want to draw a of your focus on the incremental cost effectiveness ratio, and this is what determines if, if something is cost effective or not. Uh, and uh, ultras ultrasound screening had a $30,000 per, um, per quality adjusted life ex expectancy gained. So they conclude that ultrasound is cost effective. Now, uh, what about annual MRI? MRI costs more, but there was no gain in the life expectancy, and they, they concluded that the MRI is therefore not cost, cost effective. Now, if you dig deeper into this paper, they priced MRI at the, uh, uh, $1,400, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how they, they arrived at, at that number, but the cost of MRI is, is changing, so, so maybe, maybe it's not a, a data that we should base our decision now. 
Um, but you might ask, why is MRI cost uh, not cost effective? Well, the typical liver MRI uh, exam can take 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and we do multi-parametric imaging with T1, T2, diffusion uh, imaging with and without contrast. And the reason we do that is we want a, uh, we want a protocol that is versatile that can address a, um, um, that allows the evaluation of an exhaustive range of hepatobiliary disease. And uh, that is more like a Swiss Army approach. Uh, but maybe all I want is to open a, a bottle of beer. And for that, I don't need a Swiss Army knife. I just need a $2 bottle opener, right? So if we can, uh, we have a uh, more focused uh, objective, maybe we can do a more uh, objective-oriented uh, protocol, um, and that might make MRI more cost-effective, and that's the, exactly the, the rationale of, of coming up with an abbreviated MRI, or AMRI. So this is an objective, uh, specific uh, protocol for HCC screening. So I want to come back to the, um, uh, the ICER, incremental cost effectiveness ratio. This is, what, uh, this is the metric that we evaluate cost effectiveness. So if I, if I want to make AMRI cost effective, I need to hit some value of ICER. Right. So ICER uh, is, is the differences in cost in two different approaches, so cost of MRI and cost of ultrasound, uh, divided by the uh, differences in outcome. Um, so um, here is the 2019 CMS payment schedule for uh, MRI uh, with and without contrast and ultrasound. So MRI, actually, we only get reimbursed at $400. Um, but the, the, the price differences are actually getting narrower and narrower. So uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm able to uh, achieve a moderate cost reduction in MRI without impacting the outcome of MRI, maybe I can hit the, uh, the ICER value that makes MRI uh, more cost effective. This is a more recent um, uh, publication by the Mount Sinai Group, um, published in 2017. They did a, uh, they did a very interesting um, a sensitivity analysis in a cost effectiveness model. They looked at the uh, risk stratified screening strategy, uh, high risk group versus intermediate risk group based on the annual incidence, um, annual incidence rates. Um, and uh, they are, uh, uh, color coding the most cost-effective uh, approach for, you know, for diff different characteristics. So uh, here, if uh, AMRI specificity is 29% or above, AMRI is the, the best approach. Here, it shows the, uh, if AMRI cost is about $350 or less, AMRI is the best approach. Here, it's, a, it's saying, ultrasound, if ultrasound specificity is about 90% or less, then AMRI would be the most cost-effective approach. So now, um, since, since the reimbursement of, of full MRI is about $400, we, we are pretty close to this threshold. So if we can reduce the, uh, the cost of MRI a little bit, uh, by a little bit by not compensating the diagnostic accuracy, maybe we can hit that ICER, that's the sweet spot. So um, there are several uh, abbreviation approaches that has been proposed, and uh, one of which is the hepatobiliary um, AMRI. And this is based on the, um, the complete MRI with hepatobiliary agent uh, protocol, uh, which probably takes about 30, 30 to 45 minutes uh, uh, appointment. And uh, just for clarification reasons, I'm, I'm putting the the, uh, the T2s and diffusions in, in front of the, the contrast enhanced se uh, sequences, but typically these are done after, after the contrast, but um, just uh, bear with me. So um, the proposed uh, hepatobiliary army is to take the T2 diffusion and hepatobiliary phase and just, just do those sequences. Maybe a patient can get, inject can get injected in, while they are waiting uh, for the MRI, after 20 minutes, you put the patient on the scanner, you do T2, and diffusion, and hepatobiliary phase, and after a few minutes of scanning, you're done. Um, that's hepatobiliary AMRI, and that can be um, uh, completed in, in less than 15 minutes. That's one approach. Um, the other approach that, uh, that 
um, I personally have looked into is the, the dynamic approach that is based on the com uh, complete MRI with uh, extracellular agent. Again, that takes about 30 to 45 minutes um, appointment. And that approach, uh, we take the dynamic sequences um, and uh, maybe, maybe you do uh, coronal T2 as a, as a localizing sequence. And basically you do the MRI like, like CT. You read, read you, and you read it like CT. And, and because this only takes five minutes of time, and this only a couple of minutes, yeah, you can do uh, this protocol in, in uh, less, less than 15 minutes. Um, lastly, um, there's a potential for a non-contrast AMRI. We actually heard a presentation uh, yesterday uh, from a Brazilian group, um, and that's basically taking uh, the, pre the pre-contrast um, sequences, T1, T2, uh, maybe fat sat, diffusion, and that can probably be done in about 15 minutes. So what are the data um, on, on these abbreviated protocols? Um, the hepatobiliary AMRI, uh, probably the data is not, not that abundant, but relatively speaking, uh, hepatobiliary AMRI has the most data. Uh, three papers have been published uh, from UCSD, Duke, Mount Sinai, and again, another follow-up paper at UCSD. And uh, they showed pretty similar results, sensitivity of 80% or above, and specificity of 90% and above. So that's, it looks pretty good. Um, so what about dynamic AMRI? The data is a little bit uh, scarce. The UCSF group um, uh, compared the abbreviated uh, AMRI protocol to complete MRI protocol, or CMRI, and uh, they looked at their agreement, and uh, they showed that the um, uh, uh, different readers had 93% uh, to, to 97% agreement. Um, the study that uh, we just presented er earlier today, um, we also looked at the agreement between the abbreviated and, uh, and the complete protocol, and that was about um, uh, 92%. Uh, we also looked at the sensitivity and specificity of AMRI and the complete protocol, and uh, we uh, were able to show that the sensitivity is, is uh, higher than uh, 90%. Specificity is about 90%. 89%, and these were not statistically different, and we actually showed that these were actually statistically equivalent. What about um, non-contrast AMRI? There's only one paper that's in the literature, maybe more coming, um, and that study showed that the, the AMRI uh, had sensitivity of 92%, specificity of 78%, and uh, these were significantly lower than the complete protocol. So we have three uh, abbreviation approaches, and uh, so we need, we need to pick. Um, if we um, you can do non-contrast, and if you're going to do contrast, okay, which one are we going to use, hepatobiliary or extracellular agent? Um, uh, there is no published data that uh, compared these uh, strategies, strategies uh, head to head but there uh, is probably something coming. Um, Dr. Um, Taoli's group at uh, Mount Sinai actually presented a, their preliminary data at ISMRM in 2019, and I, I, I want to thank him for uh, sharing this data. So they, they took 237 uh, cirrhotic patients, and they compared uh, non-contrast to hepatobiliary to, to dynamic AMRI, and they, sh they were not able to find any statistically significant difference in sensitivity. And, uh, and uh, yeah, the sensitivities were 80% or higher for the contrast enhanced ones. For specificity, uh, they were able to show that the, uh, there was significant, significant dif uh, difference uh, for the dynamic AMRI so dynamic AMRI had a higher uh, specificity than non-contrast or hepatobiliary. So um, this is still preliminary, but, uh, and we probably need more data um, in the future, but, um, uh, but um, uh, it's, it's probably too early to conclude. Um, so, uh, so we have a three abbreviation strategies. So what about in com comparison with ultrasound? Because after all, ultrasound is, is the current uh, um, standard, of, standard of care. For that, um, uh, the, uh, there's, 
there is no published data, but um, there was an abstract that was presented uh, at the Korean Congress of Radiology a couple months ago, and this is by the same investigators that did a previous study. So they did a hepatobiliary MRI, the full MRI, and compared it with ultrasound, right? So they just took the, the abbreviated sequences and they re-evaluated re re that data. And they were able to show that both non-contrast and hepatobiliary AMRI were significantly uh, uh, higher than ultrasound. Um, and the specificity is a little bit confusing. Uh, ultrasound was not uh, different from non-contrast or hepatobiliary AMRI, but non-contrast AMRI had a signif statistically significant higher uh, specificity than hepatobiliary. So again, the data is a little bit confusing, and, and it, you know, I, think, I think we need more data to conclude, but uh, these uh, data uh, are going to be, uh, probably going to be available in the next, uh, next few months. Um, there are other ongoing and up upcoming clinical trials that uh, compares AMRI to ultrasound. And here's a trial going on in Korea um, that uh, is um, comparing biannual, biannual ultrasound to biannual non-contrast AMRI. Uh, here's another study that uh, just started, uh, a biannual ultrasound and annual hepatobiliary AMRI, uh, also in Korea. And the uh, last one is, uh, it's, Pro, uh, probably about, about to start, uh, sponsored by ECOG Acrin. It's a multi-center, prospective paired screen, screen trial, also looking at ultrasound against uh, hepatobilia AMRI. Um, so I want to compare just by highlighting some, some of the differences between these uh, approaches. So obviously there is a uh, differences in the, the contrast types. Uh, uh, non-contrast AMRI uses no contrast, and that translates to uh, differences in cost. So hepatobiliary agents are more expensive than, than the extracellular. And another, ma another major difference is that the dynamic AMRI uh, uses the major features for ACC detection, whereas hepatobiliary and, and uh, non-contrast AMRI uh, relies on the, the ancillary features for detection. And, and the, uh, the consequence of that is that the dynamic AMRI uh, the follow-up the follow scan uh, may not be necessary for, if you do a dynamic scan. If, if you have a, a LIRAS-5, you're done. Whereas um, other uh, non-dynamic AMRI, you have to recall the patient for diagnostic CT or MRI. So in summary, several promising uh, Revit uh, strategies have been proposed. And regardless of the, the exact strategy, AMRI is gonna, probably going to be superior to ultrasound in sensitivity. Specificity is still not, not clear. Uh, there are several on ongoing clinical trials. Uh, no definitive comparative data uh, across the different AMRI strategies. Um, but when these uh, uh, trials are complete completed, the scientific data uh, will probably going to be uh, pretty robust. And the remaining question will be, well, can or should AMRI be offered at reduced cost? Um, and uh, how are we going to st uh, um, engage stakeholders to, uh, to make AMRI a standard of care. And that becomes a more, uh, less of a scientific, but more of a economical and political problems. Thank you very much. Sorry, I went over. Thank you, Dr. Yoko. We'll be looking forward to seeing how the AMRI arms race develops. So now I'd like to welcome my colleague from UCSD, Dr. Katie Fowler, who will be giving us an overview of what's new in LIRADS. All right, thank you very much. Um, I really don't have a lot of slides on this. In fact, you know, I was told that probably I would only need one slide for this talk. Uh, and really, and that is to say that what's new in LIRADS in 2019? And the answer is nothing. So, okay, I'm just gonna go ahead and sit down now um, and we can all grab drinks. No, just kidding, there have been some changes uh, and I do wanna bring you guys up to date on those. There have been no official changes Okay, the algorithm has not changed since 2018. So that is great news for everybody here. And this is here because I don't want you to remember the website, but I want you to remember that you type into Google ACR LIRADS and you can find any of the information I'm about to talk about there and much more. All right, so we have four individual imaging contexts within LIRADS 
And I want to start today by focusing on the diagnostic CT and MR, and I want to focus on what are the changes there and what's happened in the last couple of years, just to kind of bring everyone up to speed and make sure that we're all on the same page. In order to do that, I'm going to force you to listen to a very brief recap of how we apply LIRADS. And it's going to be within less than two minutes, OK? This is how easy LIRADS is to apply in practice. Step one, we just need to make sure that we're applying it to the right patients. So we want to make sure that we're applying it to patients who are truly at risk and have a very high pretest probability for HCC to avoid this scenario. We don't want to falsely diagnose HCC in someone that doesn't have it. Step two, we're just going to make sure that we've got the right imaging test. And really, that's pretty simple. We need a dynamic contrast-enhanced CT or MRI, and we want to make sure we don't have too many artifacts. And if that's the case, then we move on. The next thing we're going to do is rule out tumor in vain. I'm just going to oversimplify this by saying that you're going to do that by identifying unequivocal, enhancing soft tissue in vein. Next, we're going to rule out benign disease. So these are things like cysts, hemangiomas, vocal fibrosis, perfusional alterations. We want to discard those as we move through the algorithm. Step five, we're going to take out all of those non-HCCs, all of those atypical malignant-looking lesions. We don't want those to end up classified as an LR5. These are going to be identified on the basis of targetoid features, necrosis, infiltrative appearance. So where does that leave us? That basically takes us down past the first half of the algorithm, and we should be left at this point with solid hepatocellular nodules. To those, we're going to apply stringent criteria to come up with the diagnosis of HCC. And that takes us to this diagnostic table. The diagnostic table may look at first glance a little complex, but it's relatively easy if you just follow the rules. We've got the major features over here. We've got no arterial phase hyperenhancement, arterial phase hyperenhancement. We're just going to look at the combinations of these, and from there we're going to come up with LR3s, which are intermediate probability of malignancy, LR4s, which are high probability of HCC, and the definite HCCs. So that is, in a brief, what LIRADS is, and that's how we apply the diagnostic algorithm. So what's changed? What's new that you should be aware of within the last couple of years? Well, probably the most monumental thing that's happened is that in 2018, we unified with the AASLD for the diagnostic criteria of HCC as applies to the CT and MR diagnostic algorithm. In order to unify with them, we had to make some compromises. And really, the compromise was to adjust the criteria for LR5 within this one cell. The rest of the diagnostic table remains the same, but what we've removed is the requirement for antecedent ultrasound visibility, and we've simplified the approach that now we just need AFI, that's what we call arterial phase hyperenhancement if you're in the know, and we need washout. And if you have AFI and washout for a 10 to 19 millimeter nodule, you've got an LR5. What else did we do? We, re we basically removed some of the complexity around threshold growth. And we've unified. So there is one definition in the United States for threshold growth. That one definition applies to OPTN, it applies to AASLD, and it applies to LIRADS. And it's here. It's basically a greater than or equal to 50% increase in size in less than or equal to six month interval of time. The other versions of threshold growth that we recognized in the past have now been kind of demoted to subthreshold growth. So what do we know? This happened in 2018. Um, we've had time to think about this. We've had time to assess the literature. Some papers have come out. We have some retrospective reader studies, which very simplistically putting it, have shown increased sensitivity for HCC with the 2018 criteria, as one might expect. This has resulted in a minimal decrease in specificity, which does not appear, at least in the papers out there today, to be significant clinically. And we have overall improved accuracy, especially for small HCCs. If we want to look at this from sort of a different perspective, this is again from Dr. Cherniak, her second shout out of the night. Uh, and this is a retrospective chart review of over 600 observations. And if we look at it from the lesion perspective, what's happening when we apply 2018 versus 2017? 
Well, what's happening is that we're moving a lot of these observations from the LR4 category to the LR5 category. So they're going from kind of an indeterminate category to a definite category. If we look at this from the patient perspective, with regards to transplant eligibility, we know the importance of T2 stage. Patients with T2 stage HCC may be eligible for automatic meld exception points. That gets them a liver a lot faster than if they don't have T2 stage disease. And it really had very little impact on the overall T2 stage. So in summary, for this particular piece of the talk, we're not done overall, but we have updates to the LR5 criteria in 2018 that I've just reviewed for you very quickly. And these updates appear to give us better accuracy, especially for small HCCs. So what's new in some of these other uh, contexts that we have? How about the treatment response algorithm? So this was released in 2017. This was not updated in 2018. And for those of you, you've probably seen this out there, and hopefully some of you are using this in practice. But we basically have three categories. We have non-viable, equivocal, and viable. So what has changed is that we're starting to get some emerging evidence to let us know how we're doing with this. This was basically the result of expert consensus and best available evidence at the time. But really, this requires some validation steps to see if the LRTRA is good and if it functions the way that we think it should. So there aren't a lot of papers out there, really just a couple. And it shows, at least in this paper, that the TRA performs OK on CT and MRI alike. And it performs as good or better on a lesion by lesion basis if we apply M-resist on the lesion basis. But I want to draw your attention to this paper. And from the same group, we're about to see another paper. This one is focused on TACE. And they looked at the inter-reader reliability for the TR categories and found it to be moderate, similar to what we've seen in most publications for the overall LR category at diagnosis. They found, as you might expect, that AFI tends to be the most important feature for differentiating viability from non-viability. And the majority of this is probably the most important point, I think. The majority of the LRT are equivocal were pathologically viable. And this was a study where they compared the imaging to the explant pathology. So they had a nice correlation to look at there. And the majority of them were, in fact, pathologically viable. So what does that tell us? That tells us, well, maybe we need to reconsider the way that we're assessing uh, equivocal. And we need to make sure that when we say something's equivocal, that from the management perspective, our clinicians know the implications of that. So I only have 15 minutes. So we're going to cruise through a couple of other contexts here. How about CEUS? Well, nothing has really changed, unfortunately. CEUS has been around since 2016. We have not updated the criteria within recent years. And unfortunately, it's not recognized by the OPTN for meld exception points. It's not recognized by AASLD. It wasn't part of the unification that they agreed to when we all unified together. However, I do think this might change in coming years. There's quite a bit of emerging evidence and a lot of large cohort studies showing that there's a very high positive predictive value for LIRAD CEUS 5, category 5, for HCC. And that it actually performs very well at discriminating between HCC and non-HCC malignancies. In practice, we tend to see this be most relevant when we have a lesion or maybe two lesions that require some further workup. So if you have an indeterminate lesion with regards to transplantation status, an LR3 or 4, sometimes CEUS can be done and can really help us to be more confident in saying this is a definite HCC. So what else is new? Uh, we've got a new logo. I hope you all noticed. So you all need to update your socks, ties, pins, belts, and other paraphernalia that you own that's LIRADS related. Uh, we have translated in nine languages. This happened in 2017. For any of you who are from other places in the world, we are still looking for ambassadors, people to take LIRADS to these other places and bring it home in a translated form. So if you're interested in that, please reach out. We have a manual. If you have not gone to the website and looked at this, I strongly urge you to do so. It is an unabridged Bible of HCC imaging. It is 16 chapters long, and it covers everything that you possibly want to know about HCC. It is a very valuable resource, and it is entirely free. So please take a look and advise your residents, fellows, and trainees to take a look as well. So we've done a little bit. 
Um, but really the question, I think, is where do we go from here? And maybe that's what people are a little bit more interested in hearing about tonight. So I'm going to finish up with kind of the future directions and where we're headed. First, I want to shock and awe you with this timeline just to show you how busy we have been in the past. Since the inception in 2011, there have been multiple updates uh, and multiple additions. And really where we're headed is for the next major update in 2021, and this will be our 10-year anniversary. So what are we doing in the meantime as we prepare for 2021? Our first or primary thing is that we really want to unify the world with regards to the lexicon that we're using. We want all of the literature to use the same terminology so that we can more easily synthesize the data that's out there. We're contemplating major features. Uh, we're contemplating a complete overhaul to the diagnostic table to further simplify it. With regards to the major features, I think the main thing we're looking at is whether or not hepatobiliary phase features could be made into major features. If you're familiar with some of the worldwide uh, methods for diagnosis of HCC, you'll know that in other places like Japan and Korea, they actually use hepatobiliary phase hypointensity as a major feature. We've had a discussion in the literature about this. Is it time to expand the definition of washout appearance in LIRADS? I won't go into too much detail about this because it tends to be a little bit of a, a nuanced argument, but the idea here is whether or not you can use transitional phase hypointensity as a washout feature, a major feature, which LIRADS currently does not allow you to do. The initial um, literature that we have on this is mostly coming from retrospective Asian studies. Of note, they have a different demographic than we do a lot of hepatitis B non-serotic patients. So we don't know if some of the results they're seeing, which demonstrate only a minimal decrease in specificity and improvement in sensitivity, would really translate to the Western cohorts. So this is my point to urge you all, if you're interested in research, to consider looking at this as a possible next project. How about screening and surveillance? So here I just want to give one last shout out to abbreviated MRI. You just heard Takeshi talk about it. He did a great job. And I think we really are on the cusp of seeing this coming along. AMRI is really a promising modality for screening and surveillance of HCC. Of course, as Takeshi pointed out, compliance factors into these cost effectiveness uh, models. And we actually may also need some individualized risk stratification. Perhaps a one size fits all with ultrasound surveillance method is not the best or most effective means. And finally, Unification with OPTN. I've kind of hinted at this, and those of you who are familiar with the landscape of diagnosis of HCC in the United States will know that we have three systems. Worldwide, we have a lot more, but even just in the United States, we have three systems. OPTN is the one that governs transplant allocation, and so any center that does transplants has to use OPTN or has to at least try to translate LIRADS into OPTN. So it would be wonderful if we could unify with them. What we need to do that, it's not entirely clear, but probably a focus on patient level outcomes would help with that. And ultimately, instead of having sort of three separate timelines, we'd love to have one system that unifies a diagnosis and simplifies it for us as radiologists. So in summary, LIRADS 2018 was the last official update. You're all familiar now with the major pieces of that and how that changed, in, a, in particular with regards to the small lesions and the new threshold growth definition. The next version is coming out in 2021, so if anyone is interested in helping with that or um, giving feedback, we're always open to user feedback on any areas that you think could be improved. And I just want to put the urge out there that there are some areas where there are gaps in knowledge, where we need better research and evidence to make these decisions to improve the algorithm. Again. Go to the website, check out all the materials, and with that, I'm done. I want to thank all the speakers for this fantastic session. We've got only a few minutes before the business meeting begins, but we're open for any questions that we might have available. Um, otherwise, I'm sure that you can hunt down the speakers um, later this evening or right now, and uh, thank you for your attention. Oh, sorry, we do have a question. Hi. Go ahead. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the AMRI and its adoption to clinical, clinical practice. I've been, uh, um, so with the new LIRADS, it looks like we really not need the pre and post contrast, as uh, Dr. Yono has said, but 
my colleagues are very worried about the ancillary features and the role in uh, upgrading or downgrading the, the, the lesions. Um, and it's been a, a really hard stop in our ability to uh, really adopt the AMBRI uh, at our center. Do you have any advice on uh, how I can take some uh, counter arguments back to my center after SCBTMR? I can give you some great counter arguments. So uh, I'm coming from UCSD, and you know Claude Serlin brought AMRI to UCSD several years ago. So we've actually been doing it clinically, and it is so wonderful. When you have a list of I don't know, most of you, your MR is getting out of control, right? You sit down, you've got 30, 40, maybe even 50 studies to read a day, and it is burnout city. These AMRIs, when they're on your list, three sequences. So, so these are the hepatobiliary AMRIs, hepatobiliary not the AMRIs. Not yeah. AMRIs. So there's we, um, AMRIs. we have not been doing the dynamic AMRIs. If you guys, you want to comment on those? So uh, we have not been doing um, uh, dynamic AMRIs for clinical care uh, because uh, we are st still struggling how uh, we reimburse uh, for that for that type of study, and uh, some people uh, in this audience might have a better idea. Uh, but uh, I, just, I, I want to um, uh, answer the other question about the ancillary features. So ancillary features are now optional, right? Uh, and and uh, the interreader agreement of uh, of uh, ancillary features are quite low. And that, you know, if you can't agree on um, on answer features, why use them? And that's, that's probably why the LIRAS took it out. So, uh, but uh, uh, dynamic AMRI is a CT-like, so it's perfectly, you know, if CT is fine, dynamic AMRI should be fine. Uh, we do dynamic AMRI for certain uh, patients at the University of Wisconsin, and it's almost as easy to read as the hepatobiliary. Um, and what we do is we do a baseline with the complete MRI so that we can detect and characterize all of the benign lesions. And then on subsequent follow-up in patients that don't have an HCC, we can follow that with the dynamic AMRI, very similar to what Dr. Yoku showed. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, if we get another minute, um, I just wanted to ask maybe all the speakers, but maybe Dr. Kamel and Dr. Del Chiaro about um, MR for pancreatic adenocarcinoma, and if they have any thoughts on that. I know Dr. Del Chiaro in uh, Karolinska did a lot of MR, so. Because pretty much everything we have been seeing and we rely on typically is CT. I agree. I think for screening for adenocarcinoma, I would rather get a CT and MR. Yet, in the context of the follow-up of the pancreatic cysts, where many patients get MR after a baseline CT, I look very carefully, as was mentioned earlier, T1 pre-contrast, because the bright signal of the pancreas oftentimes helps me pick up an adenocarcinoma. I look for a dilated duct. But if I am looking or staging pancreatic adenocarcinoma today, I would get a CT, not MR. I basically totally agree, and uh, I also agree on the cystic lesion part. Uh, if you don't mind, I have a very short question for you. Uh, you probably know I lead it for many years, uh, the European group on cystic lesion, and actually, I'm, I'm sorry that today we didn't see the basically the only existing evidence based guideline we published in 2018, and actually in which your institution really strongly participate, because there are several authors for your institution, and uh, with more, let's say, objective criteria than the one I mean, we had in the past. And I think this is a message I want to launch. I mean, in this case, what we did, we put together expert radiologists, gastroenterologists, surgeon, oncologists, everyone. That's I think we should do even for pancreas cancer, putting together everyone and not doing radiologists by themselves, gastroenterologists by themselves, surgeon by themselves. So I would like to know your opinion about that. If you agree on this process that we should try always in every kind, not only cyst, but also pancreas cancer, and we discussed today about that in trying to be all together instead than doing with our own societies. I totally agree. I think uh, part of what we do is the CAPS studies, which involve gastroenterologists, uh, radiologists, uh, and, uh, uh, and endoscopists as well. And definitely, I, I, I favor the multidisciplinary approach. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I'm sure that the speakers would be happy to discuss further out in the lobby. But I think the business meeting has got to uh, begin. And I appreciate everyone's attention.
For over 20 years, Meetings by Mail has provided the gold standard in enduring material CME. With courses specializing in body imaging, breast imaging, vascular ultrasound, nuclear medicine, and echocardiography, our activities can meet your entire self-assessment CME requirement for maintenance of certification. We collaborate with renowned institutions such as the SCBTMR, Duke Radiology, Penn Radiology, Cleveland Clinic, and many more in order to create high-quality content for the home viewer. Products are available in DVD-ROM format and are streaming online. 400 fully accredited hours of CME are available for your review. Presentation topics are searchable by session, faculty presenter, and keyword search. All video has optimal image clarity with audio cued to every slide. Bookmarking ability allows you to leave the activity and resume seamlessly regardless of device. We have incorporated all CME applications so you can get your certificate immediately after completing an activity. So if you can't make the meeting, bring it to you. Meetings-by-mail.com. Try Meetings by Mail and make sure you're never too busy to learn.